nature. Well, to be within nature, one must learn to respect it, lest it swallow you whole. Oh, please, Evie. Someone needs some wine. <laughs> <laughs> What? Oh. No. It's positively decrepit. It's not that bad. I knew the Carmichaels would only let me keep this because it was worthless. That picture must have been painted years ago. Well, should we turn back? Well, the carriage left hours ago. Ladies. Look, we're missing the best part. It's beautiful here. Well, it is a lovely day. And we packed all that wine and cheese. So much wine and cheese. <laughs> I suppose the cottage does have four walls and a roof. What else do we need? William snuck some survival items in my bag. What is that? Oh, be careful with that. It's capsicum expellent. William made it to ward off bears. It sprays compressed pepper, oil, and air. I imagine it would be very painful. Will it work on drunk men in the city? If it does, then every woman should carry from her handbag. <laughs> <laughs> Oh, no time like the present. <laughs> to nature. <laughs> <laughs> well, that's two dollars you owe me now, I think. Good thing you're a lawyer. I will work off my debt in your defense. And what does that mean? It means that you will undoubtedly get arrested again, Julia. <laughs> Here, Effie. This will make you feel better. <laughs> is, that, is that a real hand? It would have been once. I brought it from the morgue as a lark. Don't worry, it's armless. <laughs> You two spend far too much time around dead bodies. Are you all right? I need your help. There's a murderer out there. Our young adventurette group came out to the woods yesterday. What's a young adventurette? It's a new outdoor adventure group for girls. I believe the organization broke off from the boys' outdoor group, the young adventurers. A flurry of girls showed up and demanded to take part. Right. Now we have our own troops. Where is the rest of your troop? I don't know. What happened to you, Gemma? Where did the blood come from? This morning, I went out to gather wood when I found our troop leader, Miss Towns, laying on the trail covered in blood. She was dead. I tried to help, but... You've been very brave, Gemma. Could you show us where Miss Towns is? Maybe we could help you. I can't. I'm scared. You don't have to worry. We'll be there to protect you. And besides, you can do it. You're a young adventurette. All right. I think it could have been an animal attack. It's most likely. She could also be mistaken. That the troop leader might not even be dead. She could just be hurt. You can tell the difference. She's dead. I'm not a fool. There she is. <sighs> this looks like a murder. Indeed. Oh, it must be the madman. 
The Madman? The victim was bludgeoned with a blunt object. Holding a bouquet, no less. A rendezvous gone badly. Strange place for it. A Victor Lord was released from Kingston Penitentiary last evening. I suppose he was better off in the pen. Who is this madman? I saw the shadow of a man lurking amongst the trees. Then he ran away. You saw someone in these woods? Why didn't your troop leader lead you to safety? I told Miss Towns. She said I was being hysterical. Where are the other girls? The camp's right over there. Although I don't see them. They must still be in the woods somewhere. We need to find them. Well, we can't leave the body like this. We'll split up. Louise and I will find the other girls. Where did you last see them, Gemma? They were headed in that direction. Take Gemma with you. Violet and I need to examine the body. to take you to safety. Don't worry, they're gonna help us. Oh, thank goodness. I thought we might die out here. Just like poor Miss Towns. Miss Towns! Here, let me, let me help you. Are you hurt? I am mortally wounded. She should have done a root and sprain triangle. That's a pretty good split you have there. Did you make it? That's Crystal's handiwork. She's the only one from the Toronto Young Adventurettes to have earned herself a medical badge. Right, Crystal? That's impressive work, Crystal. You could be a fine doctor someday. Can't be a doctor. She's shy. Let's get a move on before this madman character returns. I don't think I can walk. Well, it looks like one of you will have to carry her. Miss Hart will do a post-mortem when she returns on Tuesday. Take a look at this. A love letter with instructions to meet behind the Veloci factory. And is this the writer? I would expect. What was Mr. Lord in prison for? Um, he ran his horse and buggy onto the sidewalk after drinking a pint of whiskey. And that's worthy of jail time? Oh, thereby running over a young woman and killing her. Oh, could have mentioned that first. Well, this is interesting. In court, the dead woman's sister vowed revenge. Maybe she kept her word. Julia, the blade is clean. There's an inscription on it. Hmm. Young adventurettes. But this isn't the weapon. The blade is far too wide to have made that wound. I think we're looking for a smaller blade, like a folding knife. I think we need to move this examination back to the cottage. And how do you suppose that we do that? Actually, I think William may have packed me just the thing. What in the dickens is this thing? Uh, William made it. Apparently it's for floating on top of on the lake. What for? Uh, for fun and relaxation, supposedly. Uh, poor Miss Towns is having the first go. Indeed. Can you help me? I've been lost for hours. Oh, dear God. So who are you anyways? If you must know, my name is Louise Cherry. The reporter? You know me. My father hates you. Says you're a threat to civilized society. 
I am that. Seven feet. Come again? You must be at least seven feet tall. I'm only six foot. <laughs> only? You said you couldn't carry her because of the concavity of your spinal cord. Liar. Most everyone has a concave portion of their spine. Exactly. I tell only truths, specifically applied to my benefit. You are of the most sinister sort, Miss Cherry. I like you. You must be taller than my dad. I couldn't say. I've actually never met him. You're taller than that tree. <laughs> that I am. Hi, Beth. You could thoroughly whip the madman if he reappeared. I would certainly do my best. He was killed? Well, I hope it was in the most brutal way. Sorry, let me repeat. We are police detectives. He should have seen the noose for killing my sister. Did you have something to do with his death? Absolutely not. Well, you'll have to forgive us if we find that hard to believe based on what you just said. Well, then hear this. Last night, I was on the 5 o'clock train from Montreal to Toronto. The murder was around 8 o'clock. You were still on the train. Precisely. There is no way I could have done it. Do you recognize her? The peacock? Ah, oh, nope, nope. nope. <clears throat> her? Never seen her before in my life. Mm. You ran away. What was I supposed to do? Miss Tennis was killed. Stay, help, something. Girls, everyone reacts to stressful situations differently. It's an awful thing you've been through. Running away from danger is a very normal response. Tell us what happened when you lot found the body. She was already dead when I got there, I swear. No one's accusing you. Mm. We're, we're just trying to figure out what happened. After I found her, I screamed, so the other girls came running. And Bella ran away. I was scared. So then we decided that Fern and Crystal would go get help and I would stay behind. But we didn't get very far since Fern twisted her ankle. And then I heard the madman coming, so I ran away too. Did you get a look at him? No. Are you sure it was him? Why don't you girls sit and rest for a while? You must be tired after all that walking. Do we believe them? Children can be quite the deceivers. Once we get Miss Townsend inside and get the girls rested, one of us should set out for the authorities. We should all go. We can take the girls to the next town ourselves. With the madman out there? It's too dangerous. We'll be safe in the cottage tonight. If there is a madman. Louise. Come, girls. You girls wait out here. Mr. Sidious Jones. How did you get in here? Well, the door was open. Oh, so you just waltz into other people's houses? That is criminal trespass, sir. I, I, I thought it was abandoned. I, I've been using this house to store supplies for years. Even though it's my cottage? As I said, I thought it was abandoned. I mean, it certainly looks it. You should definitely keep it in better repair. But that's none of your concern. And why are you storing things in here? I, I'm, a, I'm a young adventure leader. There's, there's canned food, tents, medicine, all in that storage closet back there. Take a look. He doesn't look like a madman. Likes that killer edge. What, what happened to her? That's exactly what we're trying to determine. Did you know Miss Towns? She was a young adventurer's troop leader. No, no, I didn't. 
Did you notice anything strange in the woods today? Yes. Yes, now, now that you mention it, I, my, my troop did have a strange encounter. Where's your troop now? Waiting for me at our campsite. I came here to get supplies. What was the strange encounter? Earlier today, one of my boys fell into a giant hole. One that was clearly dug purposefully, and, and as we were getting him out, I heard someone running away through the trees. It could be this madman. What are you talking about? The girls think there's a killer on the loose. Well, well then we must get the police. Let me go. I, I can go get the help. Quite a lot of customers. The line was around the corner. Yes. Uh, miss? Yeah. Pardon me, miss? 50% off family portrait, sirs. No, no. We'd like to ask you some questions. Do you recognize the woman in this photograph? Maybe. Uh, she looks vaguely familiar, but I can't be sure. Um, your photography shop stamp is on the back of it. I really have no recollection of that particular customer. I think I have an answer. There's an entire table of these right over there. Oh, the frames, of course. A copy of this photo is already installed in the frames, courtesy of the manufacturing company. Then why is your stamp on the back of each photograph? I stamp everything, detective. It's advertising. Ah, so if someone were to purchase one of these frames, they would receive one of these photographs with? Yes. If we are quite through, I need to get back to my customers. Oh, yes, of course. So whoever was corresponding with him used a fake photograph to lure Mr. Lord to his death. Strange. Very, very strange. Before you leave, I need you to show me where you heard that person in the woods. Of course. Are you mad, Julia? You can't be alone with that man in the woods. There's a killer out there. In fact, he may well be the killer. How do we know he saw anything at all, Julia? He may well be leading you to your death. I have to find out for myself. I have my caps come expellent and my wits. I'll be fine. Keep it down in there, girls. I'll join you. I'll start the examination while you watch the girls. Why do I have to watch the gerbils? Well, I don't want them to see the body while I do the examination. I need you to preoccupy them. How? Dazzle them with your natural charm. I'll dazzle them, all right. No. Okay, gerbils. This is, uh, where I heard him. Are you sure, Mr. Jones? Quite. Well, I should be off now to fetch the authorities. Be careful. How do we know he hasn't left us on some wild goose chase while he makes his escape? We don't. He's right, you know. Gemma, what are you doing here? Help it. I'm a certified tracker. Well, you need to go back to the cottage. See these broken branches? The madman went this way. Furthermore, is that Mrs. Towns' rucksack? Where did you find this? Up that way. It was open and her things were hanging out. Someone's been through it. Gemma. Gemma, wait! Can't go wrong with 50% off. While you were otherwise occupied, I telephoned the frame manufacturer, and they informed me that the woman in the photograph passed away years ago. Oh. We need to uncover the real author of Mr. Lord's love letters. The only person with clear motive against him has an alibi. Perhaps he had some other enemy we don't know about? 
Catfishing is all the rage right now. Try some? No, thank you. <clears throat> Just one. They live in mud. Hello, Crystal. Are you all right? Are you a doctor? Not quite. I'm the coroner for the city of Toronto. How'd you manage that? I have a talent for taking things that I want in this world. But you're a black woman. As are you. I want to be a doctor, but I can't. The only one who can determine what you want out of this world is you. Miss Town said I shouldn't set my aspirations so high. She said I was more likely to be a maid. Well, you don't have to listen to her anymore. I suppose. Is there something else you want to tell me? None of us liked her. Especially Fern. She's only been acting sad. She was fighting with Miss Towns only the night before. Why don't we go join the other girls? Now, remember, it is our job as lay people to hold those in authority accountable. If you give a man an ounce of power, he will not hesitate to lord it over you. I can't imagine the boys at school lording over me. They aren't nearly smart enough. You'd be surprised. Are you finished with the examination? Yes, nothing new to report. We should move the body to the woodshed. That would be best. Girls, maybe we should go around and say something nice about Miss Towns. In her memory. Girls? <sighs> Miss Towns was our rock. Unbending and hard. That's the nicest thing you Can't could say. No. I liked her cooking. She was our guide, and she led us with an iron hand. I gather you all disliked her. She took some getting used to. She had a rather unpleasant disposition. The truth is, she said awful things to all of us. Are we ignoring the obvious? What? That the killer could be one of those hobgoblins. Miss Cherry. They're just little girls squabbling as little girls do. Where's Gemma? Who? Louise! P policeman! I'm looking for, for a policeman! I, I've been attacked. And this woman that hit you... What did she look like? Well, I only saw her back as she ran away. Do you have any idea who it could have been? Not at all. I haven't been around much for the past three years. Been behind bars in the Kingston Penitentiary for the last while. You recognize this man? Never seen him. You were both in the same jail at the same time. Lots of people are in jail. Guess you're good at your job. What were you doing in the park? I wanted to spend my first day as a free man with my new love. And you wouldn't happen to have a photograph of this new love? No, oh, of course. <sighs> Ain't she pretty? Uh-huh. Gemma, hide behind that tree. Stay out of sight. Those carcasses are ghastly. They're certainly not welcoming. Ah! Ah! Dear God! Julia! Stay still. Stay still. I'll pull you out in three. One, two... <gasps> Julia. We meant no harm coming here. Come here to steal some more? Steal? No, we've stolen nothing. Lies. Someone broke into my cottage today, and it had to be one of you lot. 
I assure you, we've done nothing of the sort. We've never been here before. Could, could someone help me? Use that to trap animals. But this one's just skin and bones, so I'll skip this meal. <laughs> Thank you. Get it off there. Earlier, we, we found the body of a dead woman near the lake. You don't happen to know anything about that, do you? Nope. She'd been stabbed, perhaps with a folding knife, similar to one a hunter might use for skinning. That's so. We also found this rucksack on the path to your cottage. It has been rifled through. Found the sack, but didn't see any body. You sure about that? You calling me a liar? Let them go! Yeah. Ah! Can't kill me. Listen, I don't know who you people are, but I'm done with you. Get out of here. Did you see anything? The next shot goes right through you! This man also received love letters, and this same photograph was enclosed. My girl was cheating on me? Uh, no. You see, we do not believe this woman was the one writing the letters. The person writing the love letters is not the same person in the photograph. We believe this was a plot to lure you out and to kill you. Uh. It was too good to be true. We are all fools on the battlefield of love. You're telling me. Uh, I suppose I should call my wife to pick me up. I beg your pardon? Your wife? Do you have a telephone? Oh, that was terrifying. I was sure she would shoot us. She must have been the one watching you from the shadows. Oh. That's a dead crow. I wonder what killed him. It's a bit of a bad omen, is it not? Hey! Hey. <laughs> Mr. Fleiss's wife is the owner of the photography studio? The deceptive photographs came from her photography studio, and now we find that she has a direct connection to one of the victims. Perhaps we should have a word. Mrs. Feist, mm. a word, please. Certainly. Your husband was just attacked. Three days out of jail already on one of his trysts. Typical. Mm. Did you have something to do with this attack? Of course not. What were you doing an hour ago? I was at my photo studio dealing with my one-day sale. You could have slipped away at some point? My employees were with me the entire time. You can ask them. I haven't had a moment's rest. I only just closed the shop. Ready? Good evening, detectives. You said you went to fetch the authorities, Mr. Jones. Yes, yes, I, I, I loaded up my boys and sent them to get the help instead. And what of your excursion, Effie? Well, the madman turned out to be a woodswoman who was setting traps in the forest to catch her food. Do you think she could be the killer? Or was she lurking in the bushes? Checking her traps. Perhaps she just takes pleasure in scaring people away from her woods. Maybe. She didn't seem to know much about the murder. Mr. Jones? Uh, yes. Miss Towns has love letters in her rudsack, all signed by yours truly, Osidious Jones. You lied, Mr. Jones. You knew Miss Towns more intimately than you let on. Did you kill her? No. 
No, 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 you, you've got it all wrong. We were in love. I, I would never hurt her. A likely story. I, I stayed behind so that I could investigate her murder on my own. Why would we believe anything you say? You already lied to us once. Hey! What is this? That belonged to Miss Towns. And it's covered in blood. You are the killer. Wait, 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 wait. I can explain. It wasn't me. I, 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 I can prove it. Stay back! Stay, stay back! Julia, stop! He's a killer. He's far more comfortable out there than we are. We have to get help as soon as possible. I doubt he sent anyone to fetch the authorities. We never saw any evidence of young adventurers in those woods at all. He must have lied about everything. We set out in the morning. What if he comes back before then? We set up a watch rotation. Time to switch. No, I fell asleep. It's all right. Everything is fine and everyone is accounted for. Oh, thank goodness. can't sleep. Oh. Oh. You can sit with me for as long as you'd like. I wish I was more like you, Miss Hart. What do you mean? I think you're wonderful the way you are. You're kind and confident and honest. Where is this coming from? I've always felt like I needed to blend into the background to get by. But then I see you and you're standing in the front. You can stand wherever you please. This is a very unforgiving world. You have to take what you want and never regret it. All right? It should be an hour walk back to the road and another three to the nearest town. I hope everyone will be all right without us. Mr. Jones's bag. Hello? Mr. Jones? There's his hat. There he is. Pushed. By who? Uh, I don't know. Julia, where are you going? You tend to him. I think I know who did this. Let me see your arm. <laughs> what do you want? I want to know why you tried to kill Mr. Jones. Who's that? Please, don't act innocent. I am innocent. You know, you've been here two days and it's been nothing but trouble. I'd say you're looking in the wrong direction. The police will be coming to talk to you. I don't take kindly to these accusations. Get off my property. I'll be back. I'll be waiting. Keep walking, girly! Mrs. Feist must be connected to this scheme somehow. She's clearly weary of her husband's philandering ways. 
But what of Victor Lourd? She had no connection to him whatsoever. And like our last suspect, she also has an ironclad alibi for her husband's attack. And there's no connection between Mrs. Feist and Miss Todd? Other than them both being women, both having motive, and both having ironclad alibis. However, neither has an alibi for the other crime for which they have no motive. What? Could they have switched murders? Let's pay Mrs. Feist another visit. Bella, get away from the window. Rest. We'll leave soon. Oh. Julia, what about this? How do you explain this? What, what are you talking about? The knife. I found it in your bag. I've never seen it before. I didn't kill her. I, I loved her. Please, you have to believe me. What do you think? It is a young adventurette knife. You don't think? Perhaps one of the girls could have planted it on him to make him look like the killer. Your husband has a hard head. There must be a connection between Mrs. Feist and Miss Todd that we're overlooking. What was that? Let's continue this conversation down at the station house, shall we? Who does this knife belong to? It isn't mine. I have mine right here. Everyone, get your knives out. Gemma, where's your knife? I don't know. One of them must have stolen it. Sure. It's true. My mom had my knife engraved so it wouldn't be mixed up with the others. Let's see the rest of them. Bella, open your hand. Why do you have Gemma's knife? Bella, stop! Nats, how do you catch a rabbit? What are you doing here? Well, I realized I wasn't very neighborly in the woods for so long, so I brought a peace offering. But it looks like you might have your own troubles. The girls were constantly harassing me, so I went to Miss Towns for help. The horrendous woman called me a tattletale and told me to be stoical as a young adventurer should be. So you killed her? My body just moved on its own, and next thing I knew, she was dead. And what about Mr. Jones? I, I put my knife in his bag because I knew you would think he was the madman. You pushed him off the cliff? I figured that if you found him dead with the weapon, it would... It would all be over. I was scared. You tried to kill him to cover your crime. What's going to happen to me? We were indeed strangers. We met for the first time at a parole hearing a week before the release of my husband and Mr. Lord. I wanted revenge on my sister's killer while Mrs. Feist sought to dispose of her husband. I needed to be rid of that filthy philanderer. I just wanted to move on with my life. She found herself a new man. And so you devised a plan to switch crimes? 
Killing each other's targets would provide us both with alibis. So Miss Todd didn't uphold her end of the bargain. And thus the scheme unraveled. The plan was quite ingenious. Hmm. Not genius enough. Easy does it. Goodbye, Gerbil. Later, Louise. Will you carry me again? There's a very nice officer outside who will help you with that. Are you sure you have everything? Yes, I do. Thank you, Miss Hart. Will you be our new troop leader, Miss Hart? I'm sure you'd be wonderful. Ugh, I don't think I can handle any more of the woods. But with or without me, I hope that you'll stay true to yourself. I will. What shall I do with this place? Perhaps you could restore it to its former glory. We could make a cute rental lodging. Let's not get carried away. Maybe I'll rent it to the Young Adventurers Association. Oh, that would be lovely. That way they'd have a comfortable place to stay for their woodland trips. And I can make a pretty penny. Mm. I think it's time for wine. Mm. Yeah. Shame about the floaty. I was looking forward to trying it. Oh, I know. I suppose we should burn it. <laughs> <laughs> what are you wearing, Effie? Where did you get such a scandalous swimsuit? The racing ladies of Milwaukee wear these. It's positively salacious. You're going to give people the wrong impression. I don't care one iota. And you shouldn't. Perhaps I should acquire one. William wouldn't know what to do with himself. <laughs> Please don't. A full bodysuit is obviously the elegant choice. Oh, hush. Your swimsuit looks like my grandmother's bloomers. <laughs> I'll have you know my grandmother was quite something. She was arrested three times before she turned 20. Still looks like bloomers. I'm afraid I have to agree, Louise. Miss Hart? Hmm? Don't drag me into this. I'm just trying to enjoy my summer retreat. <laughs> Drink all the wine. Julia! <laughs> <laughs> yes, sir, it's not our job. It is today. We're spreading cheer. We're spreading Christmas cheer for Christmas or for Gleaton's department store? Oh, it could be fun. Surely it's about making memories. Sir, so did you know that every department store in this city, including Gleaton's, has their own Santa Claus? The wee nip has probably cut all the difference. We've completely lost the true spirit of Christmas. Here, ring bell. Maybe that'll help you find the spirit. Sir, is it supposed to sound like an awful racket? Tuning their instrument scenes. There you go, right? Should an elf be smoking? No problem. Oh. Much obliged. A little whiskey to warm my soul. Awesome. Mm -hmm. huh. What? Indulgence is what Christmas is all about, sir. Not when you're on the job. Everyone. The parade is about to begin. Move to your appointed positions. What the devil's going now? He's dead. Merry Christmas, everyone. Please, this way. Ladies and gentlemen, unfortunately, the Christmas parade has been canceled for today. Please return to your homes. We seem to have been bludgeoned in the back of the head. Right. What? Is there something? There is something inside of his mouth. It's money. And there's a handkerchief. It reads naughty. 
Perhaps the killer thought he was no good. No. There's one Clarence Barnes. Now, that name sounds familiar. He's a landlord and not the good sort. We've had several complaints about the state of his properties. My parade. I've been working on this for months. How could this have happened? Yes, you're the event organizer. Uh... Mr. Wes Elliford. Uh, you need to find who ruined my parade. Ruined your parade? Wes, a man has been murdered. Uh, sir, do you have an idea who might have done this? Leaden's rival, Mr. H. H. Fudger. From Zimpson's department store. That's the one. Those two had a dreadful back and forth for years now. You think he would resort to murder? To rain our parade, he surely would. The body was found on your sleigh. Other than yourself, did anyone else go near it? Yes, uh, the owls, uh, reindeer, Mr. Tollyford. Uh, oh, on that robust police cap over there. So did you notice anyone lurking around today? There have been people milling around all day. I didn't see anyone getting onto the sleigh until Santa did. When was the sack placed on the sleigh? The sack was already there when we arrived this morning. So the body was likely put into the sack last night or early this morning. Did you see anything in place? Your soil hat looked out of place. Not very first to was it? To what time was it? That... I'm sorry, what was that? I said what time was... Could you come again? What time? Now what time was it you got here this morning? Instant this morning at the Christmas parade. Yes, I heard. Serves Cleeton and his garish parade, right? Ah, uh, yes, I understand the two of you have quite rivalry. Well, I wouldn't call it that. He is a money grubbing cur who has been stealing my customers for years with lies and false advertising. Did you know Clarence Barnes? He was found dead this morning in Santa's sleigh. <laughs> Santa's sleigh? His so-called Santa was a fake beard. Our Santa has a real beard. Please answer the question. <sighs> Gleeden would say it was me. He takes any opportunity to besmirch my name. Oh, his obsession with me is... That's almost flattering. Hmm. Of course I didn't do it. Look at me. I am a dignified man. I would never trifle in such... such brutish matters. Where were you last night? Oh, if you must know, last night I was having a dalliance at the ice sculpture show. With? A lady friend. Who? <laughs> it's quite the scandal, really. I trust I can count her discretion. Mr. Fudger, I am this close to tossing you in our cells. Miss Margaret Winward. Winward's department store in Vancouver? One and the same. <laughs> we'll have to confirm with her then. All right, Mr. Fudger, you may go for now. I'll contact you if I have any further questions. Oh. When you have some time, you should bring your family down to our Santa's Grotto. You won't be disappointed. Right, everyone, gather round, gather round. I've decided this year we're going to do a secret gift exchange. Everyone pulls a name out of the hat, keep it to yourselves, of course. And then you buy that person a gift costing no more than three dollars. So brilliant. Clandestine gift giving. Uh, a Santa Claus who must give in secret, we could call it Santa or a secret. Uh, uh, Santa's secret of Santa. Catch it. Three dollars. That's exorbitant. Don't be such a bloody cheapskate, my dog. On the other hand, three dollars might not quite cover it. Effie, transform the place. Like it? The mistletoe. You know what that means, George. I do indeed. Effie? Mother! I'm done with that man. Have you had another fight with father? I never want to see him again.
Detective, you wanted to talk to me? I take it you have found the culprit and recovered the funds? The... What exactly are you talking about? The robbery? The money stolen from our office. It's $1,000. And Mr. Barnes is sure to blame me. Uh, I regret to inform you that Mr. Barnes is dead. It seems Christmas has come early. I take it two of you did not have a pleasant working relationship. Mr. Barnes did not have a pleasant relationship with anyone, working otherwise. We have heard some complaints. Mr. Burns, God rest his soul, was not a good man. Lawsuits, evictions, enemies galore. Oh, what dispute was he working on most recently? He had a nasty argument with a woman from St. Nicholas Orphanage down in the ward. Well, the nature of their dispute? He was in the process of evicting them. Those children were due to be out on the ears by December 24th, just in time for Christmas. Miss Hart. Inspector, what can I do for you? I drew what in the gift exchange, but I'm at a loss. Didn't you say yourself that revealing the identity of your gift recipient flies in the face of the spirit of Christmas? I don't give two hoops about that. What should I get him? Well, something nice, I suppose. But what if it's too nice? Will it be sending the wrong message? <laughs> <laughs> what are you laughing? I'm quite a good-looking fella. Sir, just because a bumblebee likes flowers, it doesn't mean it will alight on every blossom. Why are we talking about flowers? About something? <laughs> Here seems to be having quite a merry Christmas. You can have Christmas now. Santa my letter. Oh, it certainly is a miracle. Miss? Velma Joy, I run the orphanage. Detective William Murdoch, Detective Watts of the Toronto Center. <clears throat> We'd like a word. Oh, certainly. Uh, We've learned from Mr. Barnes' office that this orphanage was on the verge of eviction. Where'd you get the money for all this? I found a thousand dollars on my doorstep this morning, but I've already sent my employee, Miss Sarah Jenkins, down to pay all the debt and stop the eviction. A thousand dollars? That's the exact amount that was stolen from Mr. Barnes' office. Did you steal the money and kill Mr. Barnes? What's the children? What? I didn't know. I did not even know he was dead. The money appeared with a red bow wrapped right around it, and I assumed it was a gift. Where were you last night? I have been stuck here for the past two days with all children packing for our pending eviction. I did nothing wrong. Thank you, Miss Joy. We need to find out if that debt was, in fact, paid. I will go to Mr. Barnes' office and see what I can find. Effie's mother has probably set up shop now. I'm afraid there's no turning back. Uh, trust me, you need to be rid of her sooner rather than later. Every time Ruthie's mother shows up, they always leave me as the third wheel. Well, I've tried. I've tried to convince her she should return to her home. I mean, it's the holidays. They should be together, right? Do you think it worked? She may have listened a little bit. $1,000 was stolen from Mr. Barnes' office, and then the same amount was delivered to the doorstep of Velma Joy. Perhaps money is the key. Well, that's so impersonal. I'm sorry, sir? My gift for Watts. Murdoch, have you not been listening to me at all? Is Watts Jewish? Not in practice. Still, I don't think he celebrates Christmas. I still have to get him a gift. Use his parts. Barnes's receptionist claims that no one has been by to pay off the orphanage's debt today. So Miss Joy was lying. Perhaps not. On a hunch, I asked for a description of the woman with whom Mr. Barnes had his argument. Mrs. Potted, she was a young woman with dark hair. This was just a preliminary sketch I was working on. 
But then I realized that description fits Miss Joy's employee, Sarah Jenkins. So Miss Jenkins could be the woman in question. That would be my guess. Then we'll need to speak with her. Feel free. Buddy. Detective Murdoch, Toronto Stabulary. Right, thank you. They've found another body. You two go ahead. I'll find this Miss Jenkins. What? Sir, in here. Good Lord. Mr. Flatius Grimes, a local loan shark. Sir, this ledger was on the desk. It appears to contain a list of his debts. Both of his kneecaps have been broken. I've heard that that's what men in his line of work do. Poetic. Oh. Miss Sarah Jenkins. It seems she was also in the hawk to Mr. Grimes. Quite a coincidence. All right, Henry, let's get the body down to the morgue. Yes, sir. Uh, apparently Mr. Grimes' brand new automobile has been stolen from the driveway. A flashy red number. Another theft. Just like the first victim. And the only person that seems to be connected to both of them is Miss Jenkins. George Crabtree! How could you? What did I do? It is completely unacceptable to, th to throw my mother out of our house. I did no such thing. Well, Mother says you did. And who you could believe, me or dear Newsom? It's a toss-up. Effie, all I did was encourage her to make up with your father. I said that the holidays were no time to hold a grudge. This arrival has thrown a bit of wrench in our plans. It's our first Christmas in our new home. We should be spending it together, alone. She is my mother. We'll have to figure it out somehow. Miss Jenkins, we've now connected you to both victims. You got into an altercation with Mr. Barnes a couple of days prior to his death. And you're in debt to Mr. Grimes. The orphanage is my home. They took me in when I had nowhere else to go. Then why steal the money Miss Joy gave you to pay the orphanage debt? I didn't steal it. I was on my way to pay it off when I heard of Mr. Barnes. I figured he didn't need the money anymore. So I was taking it to Mr. Grimes instead. But well, then you killed him. No, of course not. When I got there, there were police everywhere, so I left. Do you have an alibi for your whereabouts last night? I was on a nighttime stroll. I'm not an easy sleeper. Can anyone confirm that? No. But I swear on my life that I'd neither of those men any harm. I'm sorry, Miss Jenkins, but we're going to have to place you under arrest. <sighs> Mr. Grimes was killed with a swift blow to the back of the head with a blunt object. Exactly like Mr. Barnes. Well, the wound quite similar. Likely the same killer. You've enjoyed some of the finest things that life has to offer. This is an odd term. Um, what's something a lady might like for Christmas? I'm sure Julia would do well with a nice bottle of sherry. Yes, she certainly loves her libation, sir. <laughs> Any other suggestions? I really couldn't say. I'm not much interested in Christmas at all. Not even the gifts? Peace and quiet is the only gift I'm seeking. I found something. A handkerchief? There's a note. It reads naughty. It seems someone has taken Santa's Christmas list to heart, punished the naughty, and awarded the nice.
Next what? I think I am going to be the next thing on the naughty list. Henry, don't be ridiculous. Well, he is after the naughtiness. You and your liver pie know I've done some very bad things. You're the one who ate my liver pie last week. Please, George, focus. Henry, I'm busy. I forgot to miss right. Sir. George. What's the matter? Sir, what do you do when a guest who you didn't invite in the first place refuses to leave your home when you're trying to have a romantic Christmas holiday with your new wife? That's a rather specific question. Uh, I suppose you try to enjoy the holiday with said guest. Because you have a rather large house. I'm right? an automobile to take. <clears throat> Does it belong to Sarah Jenkins? No. It would just be for a short while. Pardon me, young man. Your parents purchased this car? No, it's from Santa. It's a gift so that we get their father for Christmas. You wouldn't have seen him otherwise? Well, he works in Perry Sound, and Mother said he wouldn't make it back this Christmas. But now that we have a car, we can go to him. And when did Santa drop this car off? It wasn't there in the morning, but it appeared after lunch, like magic. Miss Jenkins was already in her cells. I'm releasing you for the time being, but don't go far. Good day, detective. Oh, hello, ladies. What are you doing here? Well, I thought since the parade was canceled, we might take Suzanne to see Santa. I respectfully decline. I respectfully decline your decline. Juna, what does Santa Claus have to do with the birth of Christ? Just get your coat, will you? <laughs> Dr. Upton? Uh, it's a Christmas gift for Suzanne. Oh. Well, how thoughtful of you. Thank you, Henry. Uh, well, I do love children. Shall we? Come on. <laughs> Day late, a dollar short, it's Higgins. Oh, shut up, George. I mean, I am a servant of goodness. the only place in city where children can leave their letters to Santa. <laughs> Isn't that adorable? 25 cents to take a photograph with Santa. It's preposterous. Oh, reach down deep within and find your Christmas spirit, William. I fear that may be long extinguished. Christmas is becoming nothing but a cheap facade. And Santa Claus, con man that takes money from little children and leaves them with nothing but disappointment. Sir? What's all this about Higgins? Why are you bringing me milk? It's possible. Possible? I'm not a sick child. Well, there's a lot of rum in it. Oh. Say no more. Mm. Oh, it's good. It's very good. What have you done this time? What do you mean? I'm just being nice. Nice is not your nature. What's going on? Just spreading some Christmas cheer. Something's wrong in the state of Denmark. Did you find your dress for the concert tonight? No, I'm afraid we'll have to miss it. I went to the box office and they said it's sold out. I already told you I bought us tickets. Two. We need three, one for other. I still don't see the issue. George, we can't leave her at home alone in such a fragile state. If you, in a few hours, she'll be fine. Absolutely not. We're missing the choir, and that's that. 
Thank you for the car, Santa. <laughs> you are very welcome, son. I'm glad that I could help. Oh, 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 oh. Danny, do you remember me, Detective Murdoch? Yes. Um, when you wrote your letter to Santa about the car, did you put it in that mailbox? Yes. You tell them your Christmas wishes, and then they come true. Thank you. Julia, what is going on? Julia, I believe Santa Claus may be the killer. What? William. Pardon me, Mr. Nicholas. Detective Murdoch, Toronto Constabulary. I need you to come with me. Ho, ho, ho! Hello, son. Well, now, what do you want for Christmas? Get up, or I will fuss you up. Ho, ho, ho! How about a shiny new bat? <laughs> oh, that's it. Ask him a question. You can't put him in jail. I never said that. You're ruining Christmas. <laughs> All right, you're coming with me. What? I didn't do anything. Help! Move it. You sent a fuss. very definitely on naughty list. Those children are scarred for life. You resisted arrest. And you destroyed Christmas for those youngsters. You admitted to delivering that car to that lad's home, one that had been stolen from a murder man. I, I was just playing along. I don't know anything about a murder. What about the orphanage? What orphanage? Don't play games with me. The children of St. Nicholas Orphanage wrote you to save them from being evicted. Then they receive a large sum of money. I had nothing to do with that. Look, 11 months of my life, I'm a blacksmith in Picton County. One month a year, I play Santa Claus. If I had the money to buy roadsters and save orphanages, do you think I'd be doing what I'm doing? Truth be told, I don't even read damn letters. I do it. What? Nothing. You're a fraud. I'm a man with a job. I work hard at every day. Ask anyone. Now, will you let me go? I'm not in the business of relieving killers. I didn't kill anyone. How goes the Ebenezer? Sass is still in the cells? He remains the most viable suspect. And what about the children waiting for him? I'm sure Mr. Gleaton will just hire another one. What do you think about wristwatches? They seem quite practical, actually. Why? I'm thinking of getting Watts one. I hear they're all the rage. But I wonder. Wonder what? Would you consider a wristwatch jewelry? Oh. Well, I suppose. If one wears an adornment, jewelry. Yes, but. It remains a pseudo-gift. Although, these are much more than three dollars. Oh, my very own Ebenezer Scrooge. You've been speaking with the inspector? No, but if the shoe fits. Where's Susanna? I just put her down. I'll kiss her goodnight. Did you bring her lump of coal? Oh, oh. witticisms abound. Dear 
Dear Santa Claus, do the misdeeds of my parents affect my position on the nice list? I myself have been a picture of niceties all year long, and I hope to see the rewards of that with the band award. With sincerity, William Murdoch. Could you imagine hearing Handel's Messiah live and in person? Yes. Well, there's always next year, George. Gingerbread. Get it while it's hot. No, thank you, Mrs. Newsom. It gave me terrible indigestion. Well, more for me and Effie, darling. Mother, you know I don't like gingerbread. Oh, well, your father loves it. Oh, he really does. I'll just... I'll just throw it away. Would it have killed you to try one? Well, yes, it might have. It gives me terrible indigestion. You said, George. Severe indigestion, Effie. Thank you, Henry. Best of season to you, sir. What are you up to? Um, two deaths so far have been linked to these letters. I'm looking for the next possible victim. Could you use help? Well, certainly. Thank you, Henry. My pleasure. Look for any mention of people who have been naughty. Yes. You know, sir. This Christmas has rattled my nerves. One wonders what the holiday is coming to. I couldn't agree more. It's shame. Where's your mother? She won't leave her room. Well, why don't you take her out shopping? That'll cheer her up. George, what would cheer her up is my father coming to get her. Then ask him to. He would never. He's very proud. Then we'll give him a reason to. Come with me. Come on. You sure this is a good idea? What do you want me to do? Well, just root around. Root around? Yes, root around. You're, you're discovering the wonders of a new planet. Well, how do you propose I do that? Oh, just root around. There we go. Excellent. This will get your father here too tweet. Most of the letters were unopened, sir, except for these. This one is complaining to Santa because her father doesn't make enough money to buy her what she wants. And this one, he's asking for an automobile. Children don't know what things cost, sir. They should learn that the important things in life don't cost a thing. Well, I suspect that's a lesson lost on most of us, sir. Most of what I make, I spend on Ruth, and it's never enough. I swear sometimes it's... Yeah. It's Christmas. Hang on, sir. Have a look at this one. It's a letter from the orphanage. Oh, yes. It's from little Tina, asking Santa to make Mr. Barn disappear. It seems Santa granted her wish. He certainly did that. Anything you'd like to say? I've never seen this before. It was opened. And as I told you, I don't read the letters. Well, then who does? I didn't think anyone did. I mean, how children get what they want if you do? Of course, you're not real. Can I leave now? You can leave when this matter is resolved. To get you anything? Milk and cookies? You have anything stronger? Let's see what I can do. Oh. I must confess, this season never gives me much joy. You're Scrooge as well. Uh, excuse me? Charles Dickens? A Christmas Carol? You read Charles Dickens? What's wrong with Charles Dickens? Oh, well. I've never been one for fiction, but fiction combined with Christmas themes is just too much. Oh, I share the same feelings. I've never been one for the holiday. Not even as a child? Oh, especially as a child. Father was always running one scheme or another during Christmas. It usually ended up in us being on the run before the day even came. Mm -hmm. So it's hard to miss what you never had. 
So all it is for me is another day, complicated by the fact that you have to buy someone a gift. And if you don't buy the right thing, they'll judge you for it. Oh, don't worry, Miss Hart. I don't want for much. I'm not buying for you, Llewellyn. But I do know who is. So that's hell. Are you curious? Well, help! Anyone, help! There's something going on over at Gleaton's. Just closing up for the evening, I saw this. Uh, Detective Llewellyn, what? The traffic constabulary. Are you all right? Mm -hmm. Oh, hmm right. Oh, thank you. Let me guess. No. Mother? Mother, really? What's she doing? <sighs> Leaving. Well, she can't do that. Why? Because your father might be on the way. Miss Newsom, please, you can't leave. Where are you even going? My sisters. I'm not welcome here, and I won't stay where I'm not wanted. How can you say that? I want you here. Please, Deirdre, I, I want you to stay. I want you to be to be happy for Christmas. Isn't that right, Ed? Yes, that's right. What would be more important than being with family at Christmas? Did you just say family Christmas? Did you just say that? A family Christmas? When Perry isn't here? Thanks. Do you ever think before you speak? Mother. No. Mother. No. We didn't mean that. Oh, for the love of saints, Ethan. Who did this to you? I didn't see. He hit me from behind. What can you tell me about this? Whoever clobbered me jammed into my mouth. Who is Amanda Blake? She's a student of mine. Oh. We received this, Mr. Mark. Please, Santa, I have been ensnared within the clutches of a horrible monster named Mr. Peregru Lark. He takes pleasure in being horrible and making children cry. Most recently, he has stolen my favorite spinning top right before Christmas. And I am anguished. Huh. This is funny. That is the best piece of writing Amanda has produced in some time. Why did she call you a monster? I admit, I am a teacher who runs a tight ship. I am certainly not a monster. And why would she write this? I repeatedly told her that she could not bring her toys to school. She wouldn't listen. She brought in this terribly annoying spinning top. So I confiscated it. That's all? That's all. Certainly not actions punishable by death or... Have a Merry Christmas, Murder. You as well, sir. Off home? Not quite yet. Oh. Mass? No. I'm going to stop by the Blake residence. The killer tends to reward the nice. Perhaps I can catch him in the act. Much of a Christmas Eve? Well, I'll be there on the day. I'll go with you, sir. Oh. No, thank you, Henry. It's Christmas Eve. Time doesn't take a break for holidays, sir. What's going on with you, Higgins? Nothing. Ever since this Christmas killer came out, you've been acting like a decent person. Something tells me that somebody is there on the list. Just doing my job, sir. It might be too late to make amends. Hang on, sir. I'm coming. Two months before Christmas, Ruthie provides me with a list of objects she desires. They're ranked and itemized. It's my job to find them. Last year, I had to write to Paris, France, for a scarf, if you can imagine. Why does a woman like Ruth, who presumably has everything, need a gift? Well, never like surprises, sir. Well, it's hardly a surprise if it's ranked and itemized. Well, everyone likes a present. Not everyone gets gift. Look, sir. Is that a spinning top? It appears to be. You there! Elf! Draw to constabulary! Stop! Elf! 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 Elf!
This man's under arrest. Go about your business. Very good, Henry. Thank you, sir. I'll get it. Mr. Newsom, thank God you're here. I mean, you got the pictures. What pictures? The pictures of the aliens. I don't know what you're talking about. I've come to see my wife. What do you want? I want you to come home. Why? Because it's Christmas. Because you're my wife and... because I love you. Are you sorry? I took a coach all the way here. Of course I'm sorry. I'm sorry. Oh, darling. <laughs> okay. <laughs> Now you two enjoy your first Christmas alone, and I'll coat my bags. Now, what was this you said about aliens? Harry. I suppose I can wait. You don't see what I see. Could you clarify that? I see greed. I see evil. I see plenty of both. Well, then you know. Greed and evil are always rewarded. That's not always true. If that's the case, because of men like you and I. You and I are nothing alike. You arrested Santa Claus. Because I believed him to be a criminal. Santa's no criminal. He rewards the good and punishes the naughty. And he wasn't doing his job. So you took it upon yourself? Well, I'm Santa's little helper, yes. Well, then you are under arrest for murder on Christmas Eve. So gracious of you and George to have us in your home. I would have thought you'd want to have Christmas alone. Oh, we had Christmas alone many times. Yes, it's quite striking, Inspector. Thank you. That cost more than three dollars. What about the rules? Yes, sir. Such a stickler for rules. Y you had me, George? This is for you, sir, yes. Oh. Open it. <clears throat> Rather extravagant, don't you think? Don't worry, darling. I haven't forgot you. <gasps> oh, jewelry. <gasps> oh, it's beautiful. It's not bloody jewelry. It's a practical timepiece, nothing more. Aren't all adornments some form of jewelry? No. Yes. No, definitely not. Uh, George, what is this? Sir, it's an electric toaster. It has various settings. It will cook your bread to perfection on both sides. Oh, that's ingenious. Oh, I wish I'd thought of that. Thank you. Uh, and here you are, sir. Oh, you didn't have to get everyone a gift, Higgins. Besides, the kill has already been caught. Oh, well, I know that, sir, but it's too late to return. Much appreciate. A scalpel. Your husband, an infinitely practical man. I <laughs> should say, when we were courting, he gave me a boat extractor. Oh, <laughs> you never know. Oh, William, this one's for you. Oh, are you sure? I, I've just received a, a toasting thank you. I believe this one is from Santa. Santa? <laughs> oh. It's a Bandalore. I've always wanted one of these. Julia, how could you have known? I think Santa might have finally got your letter. Thank you. All right, everyone. I'd say we can do a little bit better than that silly Christmas concert, can't we, George? Yes, indeed we can. God rest ye merry gentlemen, let nothing be dismay. Remember Christ our Savior was born on Christmas Day to 
save us all from Satan's power, we were gone astray. finished with this shave, you'll look like a king. Let me just get my straight razor. Help! Cosmo Crabtree! Cosmo Crabtree! Uh, sir, did he just say Crabtree? That's what I heard. Cosmo Crabtree! There's a story in today's inquiry that might interest you. Sea monsters. I'm not Constable Crabtree. I'm Constable Higgins Newsom. <laughs> I'm sorry. I, I, I thought you were Constable Crabtree, but uh, would you like to buy one anyway? No, thank you. I assume George usually works this beat? Yes, sir. I suppose it's a reasonable enough mistake, but you would agree I have a more manly stride, wouldn't you? Just the one shot, then? Yes. Did you see a gunman? No. It came out of the blue. Well, whoever made the shot knew what they were doing. What can you tell me about the victim? His name was Nathaniel Marston. Marston and Sons Construction Company. He'd just taken over from his father. I see. He was such a kind man. Always tipped generously. Who would do such a thing? In my experience, good men die as often as bad ones. Oh, good morning, Mrs. Crabtree. Good morning. Oh, wonder what's all this? Well, I heard that shiny objects can deter birds from roosting around the home, so I thought I'd try and hang up these wind chimes. Oh, you'll put that up yourself? Oh, why not? I like to be useful. Oh, you know, they are awfully noisy. You needn't worry, Mrs. Halston. I'm sure they'll make a lovely sound. Well, I think the neighbors will mind it. Must do this, Mrs. Halston, because if the birds do decide to roost, there'll be no removing those nests. I see. Well, what about placing spinning pinwheels on your yard? Now, that will scare the birds away. You know, I've never thought of that. But wind chimes are so charming. I'd like my home to be as pretty as a picture. Well, of course. Oh, there's that stray again. You know, I tried to give him some treats the other day, but it appears that he only likes Mr. McDowell. That stray dog really likes you, doesn't he, Mr. McDowell? Mm -hmm. Oh, Miss oh, Crabtree! Oh, oh no! Oh, 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 oh no! Oh, call a doctor. According to the barber, Nathaniel Marston was a kind, hard-working man. But you think he was murdered by a contract killer? I do, sir. Miss Hart recovered a 30 caliber bullet from the victim's body. It was rimless and had a pointed nose. That would only have been fired from a new model gun. Yes, sir. The kind preferred by a professional assassin. And the victim ran a construction company? Yes, he did. Mm. My Nathaniel was a good, smart boy. He wasn't the kind to make any enemies. No one he may have hurt or offended. This world is full of gossip mongers and backstabbers, but he was not one of them. He was nothing but an asset to my company. A company you ceded to him? For the most part. I advise only on the larger decisions. Uh, Mr. Marston, who would have known of your son's scheduled barbershop appointment this morning? Only his secretary, Mr. Tibbins. He keeps Nathaniel's daily schedule. Where might we find this, Mr. Tibbins? I can't believe I broke my leg. You'll be back on your feet in a few weeks. I have legal briefs to read, and these drugs are making me feel a bit lightheaded. The wheels of justice won't grind to a halt just because you can't read a brief or two. 
I suppose I shall resign myself to staring onto the street until I die of sheer boredom. <laughs> Look over there. Mr. Sanders, poor man. He's waiting to see if there are letters for him. There never are. You don't know that. Oh, but I do. The mailman arrives at the same time every day, and Mr. Sanders gets up to meet him. Well, we're all creatures of habit, I suppose. Yes. Now I have all the time in the world to watch the same habits repeat themselves. Oh, look. There's the rhymer boy. His mother always picks him up to have lunch at home, and then he throws a tantrum on his way back to school. Oh, dear. Never misses a day. It's amazing. Oh, it's Mr. Ken McDowell. He helped me earlier when I fell. Well, that was kind of him. That's odd. He was so dexterous with that hose earlier. Hey, get out of here. Get out of here. Shoot. Think. No. Mr. Get out. Get out. Get out. Oh. Get out. Oh. Just playing. Really? How strange. Earlier, that dog was wagging his tail and seemed to love him. Effie, I must get back to the clinic. You rest up. Mr. Marston is correct. As his secretary, I keep Nathaniel's schedule in this ledger. <laughs> Mr. Tibbins, who else knew of Mr. Marston's barbershop appointment? If I can be perfectly honest, there's something that weighs heavy in my heart. <laughs> Feel free to share it with us. Yesterday, someone telephoned the office to inquire about Nathaniel's schedule. Oh. I didn't recognize his voice. The caller said that he had a meeting scheduled with Nathaniel for the morning, but unfortunately needed to cancel. I told the caller that he must be mistaken because Nathaniel had a barbershop appointment in the morning. <laughs> Please, go on. The, the caller then asked whether Nathaniel still frequents Perry's barbershop. I told him no. He goes to Goodwin's barbershop. You offered this information to a stranger. It was very conversational. He, he, he then said he must indeed be mistaken and, and uh, hung up without, without giving his name. Uh, I'm afraid I may have fallen for a trick. I'm a fool. Oh. <laughs> we'll give you a moment. <laughs> Well, the killer very clearly learned the victim's whereabouts from the secretary. Don't you think Tibbins is putting it on a bit? He seemed upset, but I didn't think so. Why? Maybe Tibbins fabricated the call. You think so? I've got good instincts for these things, Murdoch. Never wrong. All right, then. Let's see if Henry can find the origins of the telephone call. Mm -hmm.
all right? There's something very strange happening at McDowell's. You remember my neighbors? You remember Ken and Lee's? Uh, not really. What seems to be the problem? They're, they're digging in their yard, and they've got a sack, and they're burying whatever's inside of it. Ah, uh, Effie, uh, I'm sure it's nothing to worry about. But I'll ask William to pop over first thing in the morning. All right? Thank you so much for coming so early. Yes, Julia said you noticed something strange about yes. your neighbor? Yes, Mr. Ken McDowell over there. You see, yesterday morning, he was doing up his garden hose like this. Perfect, as if he'd been doing it that way his entire life. But in the afternoon, he was all thumbs, as if he didn't know how to handle the thing at all. Perhaps he was just feeling a bit out of sorts? But now he's gone back to handling the hose perfectly. Oh. Well, all the more reason to assume he made a mistake. I felt as though he were a different man. Oh, that's quite a leap. But, William, there's a stray dog in the neighborhood. Yesterday morning, the dog absolutely loved Mr. McDowell, wagging his tail, licking him. Then in the afternoon, the dog was growling and barking at him. Animals without owners can sometimes behave unpredictably. I called out the window. Thank you because he'd helped me when I fell and I broke my leg. And he gave me a blank look, as if I were crazy. Effie, um, what exactly happened late last night that led you to call Julia? He and his wife were digging. They had a sack, and they were burying whatever was inside. How big was the sack? But it was very dark, and I don't know. Could you go and ask? Investigate? I, I don't really see any evidence of wrongdoing. Please, please. It could be anything in there. Maybe I am going crazy. Uh, Effie, I'll, I'll go over and speak with them. Detective Murdoch, Toronto Constabulary. Is that a problem, Detective? Someone called in concerned that you were burying something in your yard last night. What of it? May I ask what it was? It was that pesky neighborhood raccoon. It had mange, and it was getting into everyone's trash even during the day. Well, probably died of rabies. It was a dreadful, ugly thing. Dig it up if you care to take a look. Sorry to disturb. Have a good day. You too, Detective. A raccoon? Hmm? Apparently your neighborhood has had an issue with one getting into food waste. Yes, but... Well, that explains it then. You see, there's nothing to worry about, Effie. You can relax. I was so sure. Sure about which? Julia did mention you should try to be careful with your morphine dosage. Perhaps a nap would be a good idea. Inspector? Oh. oh, there's a lovely couch right over here. Is there? Oh my goodness. You must be the detective and the inspector. I'm the inspector, he's the detective, and you are? I'm Marcel Marston. 
Nathaniel was my older brother. Oh, terribly sorry for your loss, Mr. Marston. Thank you. I only just heard. I was out of town supervising a project in Peterborough. I rushed home, and I found this in my home mailbox. You will be next. The note is obviously from my brother's killer. I'll admit I'm extremely disturbed. Do you have any idea who may have uttered this threat? Someone was obviously unhappy that my brother and I acquired some property recently. It was our first successful deal together. You mean the Rosedale property? You're aware? Yes. I had a constable pull all of the public land registry records that show Marston and Sons construction won the bid. It seems the legal wrangling went on for months. Yes, it wasn't a secret that my brother and I together were part of the bidding war. Well, then is it possible that one of the unsuccessful bidders in particular made this threat? I wouldn't be able to say. All right, I'll be taking this note into evidence. We'll post a constable outside your home for protection. McNabb, accompany Mr. Marston for the rest of the day. Make sure he gets home safe. We'll be in touch, sir. Well, I suppose we can narrow our pool of suspects down to all those that bid on this Rosedale property. Maybe Tibbins was conspiring with one of them. I suppose so. I won't eliminate Mr. Tibbins as a suspect just yet, sir. Constable Tucker! I need you to get addresses and details on all of these parties that bid on that Rosedale property. Will do, sir. I'll get them for you as soon as I can. You've been a bit of a keener since the Oyster Bar incident, haven't you? I just want to work hard, sir. Oh, wait. Before you do that, go to Marston and Sons Construction and obtain a set of finger marks for a Norman Tibbins. And while you're at it, take into evidence his ledger that outlines his boss's schedule. The ledger? Well, sir, it's one way to compare Mr. Tibbins' handwriting to this note. Julia? Julia, is that you? Where's my... Dr. Julia Ogden. Julia, Mrs. McDowell has broken into my house. What? She stole my logbook. What on earth are you talking about? What logbook? I've been jotting down the goings on in the neighborhood, especially after what happened with Mr. McDowell. Effie, I'm afraid you may be blowing things out of proportion. I woke up from my nap because I heard the front door slam, and then I noticed my logbook was gone. I've been taking notes on her and her husband, and now she's taken them. <sighs> Effie, I I'm worried you may be ingesting too much morphine. It's known to produce auditory hallucinations. Julia, I am certain she's been inside my house. Could you please go over there and ask her for my logbook? What? You can't be serious. Julia, please! Uh... Love you. Uh... <sighs> Search. According to the telephone operator, the call that Mr. Tibbins received was made from a public phone box at the corners of Grandview and Pine Street. What else is at Grandview and Pine? I think shops and businesses. Go find and interview any shoppers or shopkeepers who are in the vicinity of the phone box. Ask if they remember anything from the time of the call. Yes, sir. Shame you didn't think of that yourself. Sorry, I don't mean to intrude. I'm, I'm a friend of your neighbors. Okay, well, what exactly do you want? Uh, well, I wanted to thank you for helping her yesterday. She fell from the ladder. That's the reason you're snooping around the side of my house? You couldn't have just rang the doorbell? 
Oh, I'm sorry. H have you, by chance, seen a notebook anywhere? Uh, what? Never mind. <laughs> you've, you've, you've come at a bad time. Yes, I do apologize. I, I see that you've hurt your arm. Are you all right? I, I dropped a crate of milk bottles and, and cut myself. It, it, it's nothing I can't handle. Well, I'm a doctor. Would you like me to take a look? No. Thanks. Thank you. Right. Well, have a good day. Effie? Julia. Julia! I found the logbook. Oh, you did? It was in my room the whole time. Uh, I, I was at my wit's end. Well, I'm so glad you found it. I thought I was losing my mind. <laughs> uh, I think it's time for me to go back to sleep. I think that's a good idea. Well, most of the ledger is in shorthand notation, but I did find some writing. Mr. Tibbins did not write this note, and there are no finger marks on it. Sirs, I've just returned from speaking with the locals where the call to Mr. Tibbins was made. So what did you find? Well, the interviews weren't exactly noteworthy, sir, mostly trivial details, but I have written them down just in case. Detective Murdoch? Who the hell is that? Mr. Anthony Marston. I thought his son was supposed to be next. It appears someone is after the entire family. I served Mr. Marston as I do every Wednesday night. Well, this was routine for Mr. Marston. Yes, he's a regular at our establishment. It wouldn't be too difficult for someone to trail him and find out where he went every Wednesday. I agree. What time exactly did Mr. Marston arrive? He arrived at 4 p.m. as he always does. I met him at the back door, reserved for our select guest, then I brought him to this room. This private room. And what happened then? He ordered the ribeye steak, which I brought him straight from the kitchen. I shut the door behind me, giving him the quiet and the privacy that he prefers. You found the body? I did. I nearly jumped out of my skin. Mm. He seems to have been dead for a few hours. Why did you wait to call us? Mr. Marston always rings the bell when he's finished with his meal because he does not like to be disturbed. I decided to check in on him because it seemed a bit strange he'd been in there for so long. I called as soon as I found him. Hmm. And this is the only entryway into this room? Correct. Thank you, Mr. Wall. Single stab wound to the back of the head. It appears the blade was inserted into the space between the base of the skull and the first vertebra. Poor fellow barely made a dent in his steak. Mm -hmm. The murder must have occurred shortly after Mr. Wall exited the room. The killer would have entered quietly, struck, and then exited before being seen. No rest for the wicked. Do you think it's the same killer as the oldest son's met up? Well, sir, based on the professional nature, I would have to think so. Sirs, what is it, Higgins? A look at this. Steak knife covered in blood. Looks like our murder weapon. Hmm. That's odd. All right. Henry, send this along with Mr. Marston to the morgue. We'll have Miss Hart analyze everything. Yes, sir. Sir. Mrs. Crabtree. On the mend, I see. Well, instead of being out and about, I'm just watching everyone else go about their busy days. Oh. Well, then, let me ask you this. Have you seen that stray dog anywhere? The stray? No, not for a few days, actually. I take it you haven't either? No. And I have a nice beef knuckle he'd like. Well, if he meanders back, let me know. I'd like to feed him. I'm sure he'd appreciate that. Well, I mean, living alone as a widow, it's sometimes nice to have something to take care of. Of course. Well, you got my morning tea? Have a good day. Detective 
Murdoch? Just a list of names and addresses of the others who've been on the Rosedale property. Right. Thank you, Constable Tucker. Here to serve, sir. The bidding war for the land was among these parties. Those are a lot of names, sir. Who do we start with? Well, let's start with the one nearest to us. The Ruin Company Textiles, 2112 Simcoe Street. Mr. Garrett LaRue, Detective William Murdoch, Toronto Constabulary, we'd like a word. About? We understand your company bid on a Rosedale property recently. Yes. Do you know who won that bid? Uh, I forget the name. Uh, Martin, Morton, something like that. Mr. LaRue, two members of the company who won that bid were discovered murdered. Good God. Yes, we, we believe it has to do with the bid, and we need you to share with us full some details. Uh, I let the secretary, Mr. Heller, take uh, care of the details. I'm afraid I don't know much about the nitty-gritty. Are you saying you weren't involved in a bid that had your name on it? Well, I advised only on the amount to offer. W were you not aware that there was a bidding war for the property? I was. This type of situation is not uncommon, Detective. There's an auction house sort of fervor whenever there's prime property up for grabs. But I became uninterested in the property. Why is that? Buying bigger land in Leaside instead was a better business move. Besides, we felt a bit pressured by some bidders to back off. That's why we stopped bidding on the Rosedale property after raising our offer only once. Mrs. McDowell! I was wondering how you've been faring since the accident. Oh, as well as I can, I suppose. I made you a little milk pie to cheer you up. I hope you like baked custard. How delightful. I'll come back later for the pie plate. story checks out. His firm bid high on the property at first, but dropped out. A few other bidders backed out as well, citing pressure. I wonder if Marcel knows anything about this. Mr. Marston, please have a seat. I'm sorry to tell you that your father has been murdered. But I was the one who was supposed to be under threat. We suspect it's the same killer. Do you have any thoughts on this? I didn't say this earlier because I was afraid it would make things worse. But look what happened anyway. My entire family's been killed. What is it, Mr. Marston? I have an idea of who the killer is. Who? The Grime Crux family. In the bid, most of the others backed off early, but that family was persistent. There are rumors that they're a shady bunch. I'm scared, Detective. Well, that certainly narrows it down. We'll look into this family. Thank you so much. I'll rejoin the constable I left in the hall. I've heard of the Grand Crookses. No? Oh? I didn't want to say anything in front of the poor fella, but depending on who you talk to, they're either a respectable family they're a gang of criminals. They lied. I did some digging into the grime cruxes. It seems the family has been linked to several unsolved murders, but no one has ever been arrested due to insufficient evidence. See? Not exactly the saintly type. And all of the murders employ our contract killer's methods. A single 30 caliber gunshot to the forehead, a single precise stab wound in the back of the neck, all whilst entering and exiting without a trace. It all makes the grime crooks look plenty suspicious, doesn't it? And as you mentioned, all of their dealings are well concealed. But 
The head of the family, Liam Grimecrux, just happens to be in prison at the moment on charges of embezzlement. Ooh. Penny for your thoughts. Mr. Grimecrux, are you aware that your family recently lost a very heated bidding war for a property in Rosedale? It was briefly mentioned to me. Did you have a hand in commanding this bid? <laughs> <laughs> Gentlemen, I'm stuck here in prison. I can barely make a phone call when I wish. I only learned about it after the bid closed. Your family must have been very sore when they didn't win. Sore enough, perhaps, to kill the ones who did. That's a load of rubbish. Killing someone is not going to turn over the land. Now, what's this all about? Mr. Grimecrux, we need your assistance in identifying the killer in these murder cases. From two years ago, 33 caliber bullet to the forehead of a banker, a Mr. Robbie Simons, who was seated at a diner. A high precision shot from a long range weapon. From four years ago, a single stab wound to the back of the neck. The victim, a Mr. Herman Barnes, who was suspected of having borrowed money from loan sharks. And from three years ago, a landlord, Mr. Earl Ecker was found dead with double coil wire marks around his neck. He was garroted at a private lounge. And what makes you think I would know anything about all this? Well, in each of the cases, your family was suspected of being involved. Well, good luck trying to prove that. These photographs are from more recent cases. Now, we believe the same hitman is behind these cases. Tell us who. Mr. Grimecrux, if you can provide us with information, perhaps we can provide you with leniency on your current jail term. These look like they could be the work of a Mr. M. Or so I've heard. Mr. M. Don't play games, Sunshine. Who's Mr. M? I don't know his identity. Only that he's a ruthless and efficient killer and available for hire to anyone who has the money to pay. Sir, I find his claims that he had nothing to do with the previously unsolved murders hard to believe. Indeed. Look, Murdoch, one day we'll come back to those cases. We'll return to Grand Crux. But we promised him leniency in exchange for what he's told us. What's a promise to a killer? One day his dodgy dealings will catch up with him eventually. Sirs, there's been a call from Miss Hart. She says the blood that was found on the steak knife at the restaurant was not the victim's. Well, whose blood was it then? It's impossible to know. Perhaps Mr. Marston got a couple of digs in before he went to the great beyond. Did you see any mention of this Mr. M in the files, Middle? I did not, sir. I think this warrants a closer look. There has to be something we've missed. Let's have a look in this one. Before and after the gunshot, local residents, a Miss A.D. Cooper and a Mr. Tom Huey, reported seeing a milk truck being parked a block from Woolworths. The butchers, blah de blah de blah de blah. Useful information. What is it, Higgins? 
Uh, well, I forgot to hand you my notes from the phone box interviews, sir. Oh, great. More interviews. It's like picking pennies up in front of a steamroller. Now, hold on just a moment. What is it? In the Barnes case, sir, uh, two hotel staff and one guest reported seeing a milk truck drive by at the time, even though no milk deliveries were scheduled. So what? Uh, the Simons case you were just reading. Someone reported seeing a milk truck near the scene of the crime. Yes, that's funny. I spoke to a local who said there was a milk truck parked by the phone box. What's a milk truck doing in all of this? A milk truck also in the Ecker case. This is the oldest file that we have going back five years, the murder of Mr. Lorne Parker, a single bullet wound to the forehead during a private fitting at a tailor's on Claremont Avenue, a witness, a Miss Nancy Withers, age seven, saw a man exit a milk truck on the same street, and I quote, he was not my Mr. Milkman, he was a different Mr. Milkman. Mr. M. Mr. M. Good Lord. Our contract killer is a milkman? The Earl. William, uh, sorry for the interruption. I'm, I'm finished at the clinic, but I'm heading to Effie's, perhaps for the night. Is everything all right? Uh, well, she still thinks that her neighbor is up to something nefarious. I did actually speak with Mr. McDowell yesterday, and he was quite strange. Her neighbor? He's a milkman. Uh, yes. What of it? Julia, the contract killer that we are looking for may be a milkman. Did you happen to notice if he was injured? Uh, did he have any wounds? Yes, on his arm. That's what was so strange. It was fresh, but it looked as if he'd stitched it up himself. He worked for Lakeside Dairy, I believe. I, I saw the tag on his uniform. Sir, the man I spoke to said that it was a Lakeside Dairy truck by the phone booth. If he was right. Ross, about what? Her neighbor. Come on. Why are you working? There's no use calling for help. We cut the telephone line. Curiosity killed the cat. Oh. <laughs> <laughs> It is a shame you didn't just mind your own business, Mrs. Crabtree. A milkman. That's him. He's dead. A murderer? He's murdered. Yes, sir. Effie seems to think there are two of them. You're not Mr. McDowell. You're right about that. So there are two of you. Not anymore. What did you do? What do you think? My husband was a vicious killer. The world is better now that it's rid of him, and as much as I regret it, you're to meet the same fate. Milk will do your body good. Open wide. Ah! Ah! Toronto Constabulary, stop. Come here. Ah! Sit down. Don't move. Are you all right, Effie? Yes, I'm fine. Curiosity may have killed the cat. But satisfaction brought it back. So, the truth. Who are you really? My name is Daniel Dunn. And what's your relationship to the McDowells? It's quite a story. I first met Ken McDowell some years ago. Seeing the similarities in our physical appearance, Ken hired me to replace him each time he went on an assignment. On top of his persona as a milkman, Ken would always have an airtight alibi. Whenever a murder was committed, he was always at home with his loving wife. And you knew of this? And you went along with it? Why? Over time, Daniel and I fell in love. We planned to get rid of my husband, take his money, and start life anew. And we would have been able to. 
had Mrs. Nosy Parker kept out of all this. That's why you poisoned your husband. Well, he would have seen a weapon coming from a mile away. But he didn't expect a wee bit of cyanide in his glass of warm milk. Then you tried to kill Mrs. Crabtree. Pity she doesn't care for pie. Your husband may have been the killer, but the two of you have both committed heinous crimes. You'll likely hang for them. Those portraits came down quickly enough. Gentlemen, have you found my father's killer? We have. Mr. Marston, do you recognize these? They are personal checks that were found amongst the possessions of the late Mr. Ken McDowell. They bear your name and signature. I have no idea what those are. I don't even recall the man. You hired the assassin, Mr. M. He even placed a fake telephone call here to Mr. Tibbins. Perhaps because you couldn't figure out your brother's schedule based on Mr. Tibbins' shorthand. You were greedy and quick to take over. You had your father and brother killed. After the bid, you put the blame on an easy scapegoat. What? That's preposterous. I am the next victim. Marcel Marston, you are under arrest for soliciting murder and for fabricating evidence to the police. Come here. Well, I certainly didn't imagine such precarious adventure when I moved to the neighborhood. I'm glad you're all right now. I was quite worried about you. Hmm. Mrs. Halston! Oh, hello! I find the hardest part of staying at home is the restlessness. Hopefully when George returns, I can cope better. Oh, I'm sure you will. I wonder if that stray is going to return. I haven't seen him in a week. I pray that he's all right. That reminds me, Mrs. Halston. There's, um, someone I'd like you to meet. For me? Oh, you're beautiful. I know oh, how much sweet. you admired the stray, and I thought it would be suitable for you to have one of your own. Oh, I can't thank you enough. Hello. Mm. Hello, darling. I have a knuckle bone you might like. Oh, oh, yeah. oh no, you can't do that on my lap. <laughs> <laughs> 12 o'clock. I don't think I'm up for tossing a bloody tree. I mean, how much will it weigh? 170 pounds. No, oh, no, no, don't worry about that. Who's that, uh, the big, uh, ginger lad at, at your station? McNabb. Ah, oh, yeah, McNabb. I've handed him in the toss. You are the hammer throw. Murdoch, you can ring in the sheaves. So, oh, let's take in some of the festivities before the gloaming. So, when the games begin, I expect the both of you to be fully kitted and kilted out. There's the address. Flora McDonald shall take care of you. One Murdoch and one Craig Tartan will be waiting. I'm a Brackenreed. Your mother was a Craig. Was she not? How do you know that? Oh, I've been paying attention to you, Sonny Jim. Paying attention, Sonny Jim? What does that bloody well mean? <laughs> Good. Chief Inspector! <laughs> See ya. See ya. Trust there will not be trouble at these games, Duncan. <laughs> as long as you can cope with the numerous defeats, you'll be suffering. He you minds your tongue. You mind yours. You do that, there'll be no trouble. You just learned to keep your woman in line, Duncan. Campbell's and the McDonald's. No love lost between them since the massacre at Glencoe. That was hundreds of years ago. It doesn't just disappear, Murdoch. A police presence might not be a bad idea after all. Ladies and gentlemen, ladies and lasses, the final round of the men's sword dance premium category. Ah, and a round of applause to Miss Iona McDougall, our Highland Queen champion for the fourth year run. Now to the finalists. First, our Ontario champion, Mr. Ross Campbell. I love it! <laughs> and next, him, if not kind, 
Mr. Alistair Campbell. <laughs> Give me your first. Oh, the runner-up and runner-up for the past two years, perhaps. Third time lucky. Aye. Right. <laughs> okay. Next, Mr. Endon Gunn from Camden, Ontario. And last, but by no means least, Mr. Malcolm McDonald, who also hails from the beautiful Caledon Hills. First time competing, but he's one to watch. That he is. Gentlemen, take up your positions. Excellent dancing from all the, the finalists. Uh, taking into account skill and timing, we're awarding the first place to Malcolm McDonald. <laughs> and uh, along with the owner, there's a prize $20. What? Was that your saying about losses, Duncan? <laughs> Might win with a throw of a hundred feet. One hundred. In that case, I'd better go home and practice chucking heavy things around. That's a tough one to swallow. Too bad, Alistair. Better luck next time. Son. I, I did my best, sir. I know you did. That's what's so disappointing. Don't pay any attention to him. Oh, he's playing again. Let's book it off. Did you hear that? I did. In there. It appears we have a sore loser somewhere. Skin do. Nowadays, it's only used for ceremonial purposes, but historically has always been a deadly weapon. Well, it doesn't seem to have lost its effectiveness. There's a stamp on the end. Traditionally, it would always be engraved with the owner's family crest. Well, which one is this? The Campbell clan. The prize money doesn't appear to have been taken. So whoever did this had no interest in the money. Perhaps it's as you said, sir. Hate doesn't die. Mm. The murder weapon bears your family's crest. Never seen that particular knife? Of course not. It's a shame both your sons lost to the victim. The contest is fairly judged. We have no quarrel with the result. I hope, I hope you're not accusing someone in my family of murder. We're simply asking questions. Where were you immediately after the competition? I was having a drink. You saw me then? That was after the man was killed. No one in my family had anything to do with the death of Mr. McDonald. Did you know the man? I did not. So please, arrest me or let me go. I need to get back to the games. Uh, what of the young woman who discovered the body? Iona is a McDougal. They're kin to the McDonald's, but that doesn't mean she didn't kill him. Huh. They're a murderous bunch. It's a metal locator, Margaret. If your locket is nearby, we should find it. I can't believe I lost it. Thomas gave me that locket when we were first courting. I feel a bit silly doing this. How do you think I feel? I'm peddling like a mad woman and going nowhere. Aren't we a sight? <laughs> yes, indeed, we are. Uh, I must say, Julia, 
You have opened me up to quite a raft of adventures. Medicine and now treasure hunting? <laughs> just, just keep moving, Margaret. I don't want to be doing this all day. Right you are. Oh, Julia, it's making a sound. I think I'm back. Oh, 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 Lord. Exactly what we were looking for. There's no obvious cause of death. Was he murdered? As I said, no apparent cause of death, Margaret. All right. Wait, we're just going to leave him here? Well, of course not, but we're going to need some help to get him to the morgue. Oh, that poor soul. Find out what happened to him, don't worry. Right this way, Miss McDougall. Please have a seat. Now, how is it that you came to discover Mr. McDonald's body in the storage room? I was putting away the swords. And did you see anyone exiting the room as you approached? Not a soul. How well did you know Mr. McDonald? I didn't know. I knew his reputation as a dancer. That was it. Hmm. And did you notice any tensions between he and the Campbells? Not with them. I did see Mr. McDonald in an argument with Mr. Gunn, the man who was disqualified. What was that argument about? Mr. McDonald was taunting Mr. Gunn. He said he would lose and might as well withdraw to save his honor. He was being very cruel. Are you saying Mr. Gunn may have killed him in order to get even? No, didn't say that. But I do know I heard two men arguing violently. Now one of them is dead and the other is walking free. Pardon me a moment. Julia, what are you doing with this? I was just returning your metal locator. I was using it to look for a locket that Margaret lost. Oh, did you find it? No, but we did find a dead body. So you agree this appears to be an accident? There's no doubt the young man drowned. His lungs were filled with water. There are no signs of trauma to the body beyond the few scratches you might expect from the riverbed. I see. Did you find any identification? No, but there are some clues. A St. Christopher medal. Ah, oh, the patron saint of travelers. He must have been Catholic. And these were sewn into the lining of his jacket. Oh. Likely for safekeeping. Are those English coins? Yes. A total of six shillings and six pence. It's not much, but it's probably all he had. I see. Go on. Take a look at his hand. You see this bruise on his left thumbnail? And note the little cuts around the corners of his mouth. These are typical marks of a man in the boot-making trade. They would hold the nails in their mouth and often get these little nicks. That's very good. Anything else? His clothes were far too big for him. Old and cheap. English coins, evidence of a trade he was involved in, possibly a recent immigrant who came here to take up an apprenticeship. He would have likely had a sponsor. Well, Margaret, it appears we have a mystery to solve. You were seen arguing with MacDonald in the hours leading up to his death. Eh? We argued. He was an arrogant git but I certainly did not kill him. I take it you knew him? I knew him. We had competed in the past. What was the argument about? He was disparaging my ability. Said I was wasting my time competing against him. You were disqualified. So I'd say that Mr. McDonald was right. Have you ever seen this before? 
That belongs to the clan Campbell. It would have been one of them, huh? They lost to McDonald as well. They did not have you seen it. They're liars and murderers. Always have been. I've already spoken to you. Why am I here? Because we're not certain you were telling the truth the first time. How oh, dare you, sir? <laughs> Sit down, Mr. Campbell. Mrs. Campbell, do you recognize this? Good heavens, Duncan, look. It's the one you lost so many years ago. Well, it can't be. How do you not recognize it? I gave it to you. Are you certain? Aye, there's the wee emerald heart I had embedded in the hilt. Detective Murdoch, this knife has been missing for 20 years. And now it has resurfaced, embedded in the body of Malcolm MacDonald. As I told you before, I had nothing to do with that. Where were you, sir, when you lost it originally? It was more than 20 years ago. I really don't remember. Oh, I do. It was on that trip to Caledon Hills, just months before we went. Oh, she's always had a better memory than I. Must be all that whiskey. <laughs> but whether that's the weapon or not, I had nothing to do with the death of Mr. MacDonald. I was enjoying a fine Isla with your chief inspector when that poor bugger lost his life. I see. Absolutely. Oh, we were together. Besides, I stake my reputation on Duncan Campbell. I've known him for years as a man of honor. It's not too early in the day for a drink, is it, Tom? Oh, never, sir. Allow me. Sir, you are aware of the long-standing feud between the two families. Of course I am. On the orders of the English, the Campbells killed over 30 of Clan MacDonald. The massacre of Glencoe. But since Duncan Campbell arrived in Canada, he's built a successful life for him and his family, so he's not going to risk that on a dance contest or something that happened over 200 years ago. Well, sir, he has admitted that the murder weapon belonged to him. But he also stated that he lost the dagger over 20 years ago. Well, perhaps a member of his family. And where did he say that he lost it? Caledon. And the man who was seen arguing with Malcolm McDonald. And in gun. Is in Caledon, is he not? You're barking up the wrong tree. It's got nothing to do with the Campbells and the McDonalds. Well, Tom, I hope that one day soon you'll be able to afford a better drum. <laughs> well, you seem to like this one. Uh, these? They're for you, too. I took the liberty of picking them up. So, wrap up this investigation and bring the constabulary some glory. This shoe store is the last one on our list. Well, let's hope the last one is a charm. I appreciate your patronage, madam. What can I do for you ladies? Uh, we just have a couple of questions for you. I should tell you I've just received a shipment of red suede boots with needlepoint tips. All the rage. Oh, can I get a... Margaret. <clears throat> right, of course. I was just wondering whether you might recognize this man. Good Lord. I apologize if it's gruesome. I've seen him. When? About a week ago now. He applied to be an apprentice here. And you didn't take him on? He arrived two weeks late. I had already taken on another man. Did he say why he was late? Said the boat from England was delayed because of bad weather. He was disappointed, but I didn't have a place for him. I take it from this, he's dead. I'm very sorry, but there was nothing I could do for him. Do you know his name? Silas Barnes. Thank you. Did he happen to mention where he was headed when he left? He said something about looking for guidance. I see. Thank you. There are some things from the old country they could have left behind. You don't care for the pipes, Higgins? Does anyone, sir? Oh, this is quite the day. There are a few things in life that we agree on. <laughs> Let's just try to find Endin Gunn. Didn't you say he lost the competition, sir? I did. Well, 
Then why would he still be here? We don't know if he's here or not. That's why you're looking for him. Terrible news. About the murder investigation? No, no, no. It's the caper toss. That McNabb fella from your station is pulled up lame. You there? Me? Yeah, hi. You. Do you want to do your station proud? Of course you do. So what do you think, Tom? You think your man will be able to handle the challenge? Oh, I have the utmost confidence in Constable Newsom Higgins. Say that way, sir. Excellent. So you ever toast a keeper? I can't say that I have. Well, young Sean there. Happy to give you a few tips. Sean! Uh, sir, shouldn't I be looking for end and gun? Well, Murdoch and I can handle things, Higgins. Ah, uh, you'll be a splendid constable, and if you conduct yourself honorably, I'll reward you handsomely. Reward how? Oh, never you mind that now. Come on, let's go hand. Let's sign you up. What the hell, Murdoch? I think he expects us to win. Really? For now, let's just focus on finding Mr. McDonald's killer. Mm. I presume his death was an accident? We found no evidence to suggest otherwise. In that case, I shall arrange for him to be buried in the parish cemetery. Thank you, Father. <laughs> something on your mind, sir? If you're worried, I've had a thought on how I could give you an advantage during the hammer toss. I would stiffen the sh... Actually, steel could work. Let him. It's not that meal mucker. It's Stuart. He's up to something. How so? Well, this is the first time he's ever entered Station House 4 into these games. What do you think's prompted that? I don't know. But he keeps making all these vague promises to me. He's definitely up to something. Ooh. It appears he's not the only one. Isn't that one of the Campbell lads coming out of the McDonald tent? It is, sir. Alistair. Oh. Well, it appears at least two members of the warring clans have decided to effect a truce. Oi! Romeo and Juliet! We'll be needing a word. What are you thinking what I'm thinking, Murdoch? Iona pointed the finger at Hendon Gunn to keep us from looking at Alistair Campbell. Or herself. Even though she's a McDougal, which is part of the McDonald clan? She may have killed him for reasons that had nothing to do with the clan that he belonged to. Sir, sir, uh, I just wanted to say, you may have misinterpreted what you saw. Oh, I doubt that very much. And I don't give a toss what the pair of you were up to. <sighs> Have either of you ever seen this before? Not seen this particular scheme, do you? But there are lots around. Virtually every adult male owns one. Scottish tradition. Your mother insists that this belonged to your father and that he lost it some years ago. How odd. What's odd is that was found sticking out of a dead man's chest. I know nothing about that. I know nothing about that. All right, let's get back to the time of the murder. Malcolm McDonald was killed very shortly after the sword dance competition. Where were you at that time? I was in the hole, looking at my wounds. And how well did you know Malcolm McDonald? I didn't. I only met him on the stage. And how did you feel after he beat you in the competition? Something you'd been hoping to win for at least two years. Only human detective. It was rather disappointed in myself. But it was a fair match. I intend to do better on the next try. We haven't finished. You are a champion dancer, are you not? I've won the fling four times running. So why was a champion dancer clearing up the swords after the event? Maybe a champion, but I still do women's work. Did you know Mr. McDonald? In passing. He may have been kin, but he was a very unpleasant man. I preferred to keep my distance. Sirs, we have been honest with you. Could that avail upon you to keep what you saw between us? Our families would certainly not approve.
The two families are not going to say anything. So I've asked Douglas Cameron to come in for an interview. He's run these games for over 20 years. He might know more than he's letting on. So perhaps we should cancel the games altogether. Oh, no. Stuart would have my head on a block. Right. Canceling them sounds like a good idea, sir. My back has been acting up. Not keen on the caper toss, Higgins? No, sir. You wanted a wee one? Duncan Campbell is a friend of mine. Sir, a man was murdered at an event that you are hosting. Friendships don't matter right now. If you know anything at all, Douglas, you'd be best advised to share it. Duncan Campbell is no murderer. We'll decide that. So, anything at all? I saw Duncan and the dead man in an argument the morning of the competition. What did you hear? Oh, McDonald was going on about his rights. His rights to what? I don't know. All I heard him saying was, I have all the right in the world, and you know it, and I can prove it. Anything else? Oh, Duncan looked as if it might hit him. But then he turned on his heel as he shouted, God help me, I will see you in hell first. His exact words? Aye. Did he been pushed so far he even used the Lord's name in vain? I've known Duncan a long time. I've never seen him so mithered. Thank you. Uh, my games can still proceed? For now. <sighs> oh, then I'll uh, see you this evening at the banquet. This Malcolm McDonald was something, eh? How's that, sir? More enemies than friends. He should have been a copper. <laughs> Margaret, I need a rest. Perhaps we can exchange tasks. What? Oh, uh, I would, but my sciatica's acting up. So, of course it is. I can't stop thinking about them. You know, there are more and more people coming here every day looking for the promise of a new life, which many achieve. I know, but to die here, Alone in a new country with no one. Julia! Look at this! There's an initial on the hat band. S.B. Silas Barnes. This must be where he fell into the river. It's quite slippery beyond this point. Yes, if he fell. What are you suggesting? Well, his belongings all piled up neatly. I've seen this before when investigating people who have taken their own lives. Why would he do that? Well, I came here for a better life and that chance was denied. He was homeless and penniless. Perhaps he couldn't see a future for himself. If he did take his own life, according to the church, he cannot have a Catholic burial. I'm aware of that. Which is why, to the best of my knowledge, Mr. Silas Barnes suffered an accidental death. You would lie to the church? Oh, Margaret, it wouldn't be the first time. Shall we continue our search? Perhaps tomorrow. I'll get the bicycle. Scotland months nay stinking wear the jocks in likes. But if you wish a grateful prayer, yeah, yeah. Ah, 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 <laughs> Sir, is everyone here? It appears so. Why? Malcolm McDonald said something about having the proof. I thought I'd have a look around to see what that could be. You'll miss the haggis. I'm sure I'll survive. Hmm. Where is the detective off to? He needed to get some air. Hmm. Too much whiskey. Hmm. That'll be the day.
say the sound for your detective. We won't mind. He confessed he's not very partial to it. And how does he feel about napes and tatters? He's not partial to that either. Look at our side. We're a couple of thieves. <laughs> you seen a lot? You and I, have we not? Indeed we have, sir. I think perhaps I've seen enough. I'm thinking of stepping down, Tom. Are you sure? I think it's time to walk away. It'll mean big changes at the constabulary. I think I know the man for the job. Excuse me, sir? I think I know the man for the job. Get your hands off her. We'll not have our family sullied by the likes of you. Should we step in, sir? I fear the world will never move forward. Will the old feuds die? Aye. Clan Furious. They want to know what you're doing snooping around. Good morning to you. I was trying to solve the murder of one of their own. Did you find anything? I found a letter to a Jenny McDonald. What did he say? I didn't get a chance to read it. Where is it? Oh, bloody hell. Uh, what were you doing snooping around our encampment? Are you trying to pin my cousin's murder on one of us? You'd best make yourself scarce. Uh, bloody Campbells. They've ever been in league with the English. Cozying up to the police. They did no such thing. I've seen that Duncan Campbell, the chief inspector, trying to blame us for what's going on. You'd better leave right now, or it's a night in the cells. Yeah. So what do you think, Murdoch? Does he protest too much? Would he kill one of his own? About this? The man who struck me was wearing a Campbell tartan. That doesn't mean it was one of them. Someone could have been disguising themselves. Well, sir, that's possible, but I don't think it likely. The murdered man was in possession of a letter from a Jenny McDonald. That letter is now gone. They're all present and accounted for, sir, though not a happy lot. Does this mean they'll be calling off the games? No such luck, Higgins. Evidence I procured last evening was taken from me by force. My constables will conduct a thorough search of both your persons and your belongings. Uh, on what grounds? On the grounds that my detective thinks that one of you lot assaulted him. I don't like to be accused of something I've not done. You'd be wise to keep your mouth shut, sunshine. Don't treat us like we're criminals. You're being treated like suspects in an investigation. There is a difference. I will not stand for this. I'm going to see your chief inspector. This is an insult. You're not going anywhere. Is that what you're looking for, madam? You have no right. I believe it is, sir. Mr. Campbell, perhaps your family should wait for you outside. I... I won't believe in my husband. Or Ag, you should go. I'm staying.
My dearest Jenny, it pains me that our love is forbidden and that our son will be raised among your clan without ever knowing his true father. But this is for the best, for if the truth of his parentage was known, both of our families would surely shun him. What she? They're lies. They're damnable lies. Hi. You see, Detective, it's just more lies from these people. And what of the ski and do? How did your knife end up killing Malcolm McDonald? Uh, well, um, you lost it. Did you not say you lost it? It's time to tell the truth, Mr. Campbell, if only for the sake of your wife. Jenny wanted a keepsake. And if you were so sweet on her, why did you not marry? She was a McDonald. I was a Campbell. Is that it? So you settled for second best? No, no, more. I, I, I found another that I loved more. I really thought the past was behind me. That's what the argument was about. Malcolm McDonald confronted you, told you he was your son, and that he'd come to claim his inheritance. Did you attack Murdoch to steal the letter that was the evidence? It was my property. I just hope to bury, bury the shame. Did you kill Malcolm McDonald for the same reason? I will not stoop to answer these questions. Shall I take that as a yes? I repeat, I will not answer these questions. Indeed. Well, Duncan Campbell, I'm charging you with the murder of Malcolm McDonald. You'll be incarcerated until you can appear before a judge. Father! Get them out of here! You have the wrong man! I am the one who killed Malcolm McDonald. Please, please. I went back to the storage area after the contest. Malcolm confronted me. He was on me immediately. He said he was my father's firstborn son and he aimed to collect his inheritance. It's rightfully mine and I will fight for it. Do you believe him? I don't know what to believe. He said my father had written a letter that proved what he said. And the whole time he was saying this, he, he was gloating. He said that I would drop from second place to third in the lane of inheritance. And how did I like that? I didn't want to believe him. That piece of paper means nothing. Where's the proof? The proof is written right here. And cold, hard steel. But then I saw the knife, how it was his, how it was a gift from our father, his father. And how did I like that? He kept saying that over and over again. How do you like that? How do you like that? You then seized the knife and you stabbed him. I didn't know what I was doing until I'd done it. My father had nothing to do with this. It was me. I found it. <laughs> you went back to the riverbank. I found it in the larder, in a tin of flour. <laughs> Margaret. <laughs> Did we do the right thing? Yes, I think we did. The church. Well, if God finds our poor Silas Barnes unworthy of heaven, then I suppose he'll just throw him out. Oh, my goodness. Where's bloody Murdoch? Perhaps he's taken out. I've been feeling a little under the weather myself, sir. Ingrid, Perhaps... I don't want to hear it. Tom. Oh, sir, you did the right thing. It's not the result I would have wished for, but it was the truth. That is what we strive for. Thank you, sir. And if you've no objection, I will be recommending leniency for young Ross. No objections from me. Must have been quite the shock. Indeed. But I will be charging Duncan with assaulting Detective Nornog. There's Alistair. Apparently he and Ona left in the middle of the night. Mm. I'm ready to go. You should have controlled yourself. I... So why don't we take in a bit of the game as first, before we leave? Oh, 
Thank you, old friend. I'm surprised to see you still here. May I ask why? Perhaps it's best if the sins of our past remain buried or forgotten. I don't thought you'd scarp it. Of course not, sir. I wanted to ensure you had a chance to win the event. All right, lads and lasses, it's time for the sheaf toss. All you have, Henry. Teach them. Oh. 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 Feel like a bloody fool. You won't when you are tossing the hammer, sir. Just dig those spikes in and they'll give you the leverage you need. Unless I twist my ankle. Well, there is that. Let's get to it, Inspector Bracken. Read the gloaming is coming. Right. The yellow flag is the distance to beat. I know that. <clears throat> oh, good form, good form. Station house number four. Yes, sir, we don't have to charge him. This police force pays no favorites. Son. I just wanted to say. Let me speak. This is Iona. She used to be my bride. Alistair. You ran away. I couldn't just leave without telling you. You do deserve that much. I know I'm kin to the McDonald's, sir. You are not a McDonald's. You are a girl who loves my son. And that's enough. Aye. hero. Oh. oh, are you still wearing that old thing? I should get you a new one. But I just found it. Now, my darling, you are looking at the champion hammer thrower at the Highland Games. Oh, congratulations. And I must say, you do cut quite a fine figure in that kilt. I do, don't I? Mm. <laughs> Is it true what they say? Well, let's just say I can feel the breeze. <gasps> Thomas! <laughs> well, I might as well act like a true Scot. Now, this is back and read. Are you ready for a proper Highland fling? Mm -hmm. <laughs> <laughs> you experience something different, William. Different than what? 
the same things we do day after day after day. There's no harm in seeing the world from a new perspective. Even if that perspective is fraudulent? The placement of the stars cannot foretell one's future, Julia. Wow, well, that's a good thing you're not invited. <laughs> I don't know why we haven't rented out the salon before. We're selling so many tickets. Are you sure this is something we should be doing? Are you afraid of the occult? Not necessarily comfortable with it, but that's not the reason. Hmm. Then what is it? The police. They can very easily shut us down, Violet. I doubt that's going to happen. They've done it before. You may have more than one job, Violet, but I do not. Cassie, they won't. And besides, in three days, we'll be making so much money, trouble will be the last thing on your mind. This is the devil's playground. You don't belong here. Excuse me? This is my establishment. It is you who does not belong. And these are the devil's instruments. You will leave right now, sir, or I will call the constabulary to come and throw you out. You will both burn for this. What were you saying about trouble being the last thing on my mind? You must have fallen from here, sir. Hmm. So it would seem. Is there any reason to suspect foul play? Appears this is a death by misadventure. Ordinarily, I would agree with you, Miss Hart, but I found this upon arrival. A tarot card? Not just any tarot card, the death card, more specifically. And it was placed right on the body. Psychic Fair has rented out my salon for three days. Well, so you're the reason they're here? I'm just running a business, Detective. I'm sure the death and the fair aren't connected. Simply a coincidence. I don't believe in coincidences. Someone was definitely sending a message by placing this on the body. I eagerly await your postmortem. The landlord has identified the deceased as one Erasmus Scribbs. He was almost finished his dinner, sir. No sign of anyone joining him. Scribbs wasn't short on money. No witnesses to what happened? According to the landlord, Mr. Scribbs kept to himself and paid his rent on time each month. Is it possible he just jumped, sir? It is. But would he have jumped in the middle of his dinner? Perhaps it wasn't to his liking. What do you mean you have a job? It's still a long way off, but once I'm released, I'll be a handyman at a church on Trinity Street. Something to look forward to? How wonderful. It is. And um, it, it comes with lodgings on site. Oh. I'll still come over every Sunday to have supper with you and father. That would be nice. And in a few years, maybe you'll see me as a lay brother serving the community. Why a lay brother? It allows me to help the church while continuing my path as God's humble servant on this plane. Whatever makes you happy, Bobby. Now, I must go and meet Julia. We're going to the psychic fair. <laughs> Mother, the occult? Places like that are filled with charlatans and con men. Well, so is this place, dear. And you seem to be doing just fine. Bobby as well? Very much so. He has plans for a future. He's anticipating a second chance at life. Not so good. Mm. He's none too pleased about me coming to the savant, though. Oh. He shares <laughs> William's sentiment. Ah. ah, it would seem they're not the only ones. Only God knows the past. Only God knows the past. Ye should turn from these devilish vanities unto God. We're more than capable of making our own decisions, Reverend. Reverend? <laughs> 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 
Repent! Only God knows the path. God does not live in this building. Oh, so lovely to see you here, ladies. And you as well. Thank you. <laughs> Such an exotic event. That it is. <laughs> Enjoy your visit. Where should we start? This astrology? Tea leaves? I'm not sure. <laughs> Achieved using potassium. You, madam, are the marvel. Me? Yes. Your blue violet aura is arresting. My what? The luminous body that surrounds your physical form. Hmm. Take this, throw it into the flames. If you wish to see the future. Thank you. No. Are you sure, madam? You have the gift. Gift? When you want the answer to your question, throw this into a hungry fire and all will be revealed. I have no questions. Shall we? to be between 45 and 55, relatively healthy, devoid of any surgical scars. So nothing out of the ordinary then? He possesses all the signs of a fatal fall, head trauma, broken pelvis. Could he have been involved in an altercation prior to the fall? It's possible, but I believe it was the fall that killed him. So no defensive wounds then? None. He wore a... Oh. This ring has a rather distinct stone in it. Ah, yes, it's called a tiger eye. Some people carry the stone for protection and to keep them safe from evil. It doesn't seem to have worked here. Ah, very good, detective. The ring looks very expensive, and it wasn't taken. Neither was any of Mr. Scribb's money, so I suppose we can rule out robbery. I did find something curious on his right shoulder. Hmm. Well, that's an interesting tattoo. I, I've seen this before. Yes, look. See here on the flag? It's the same as the tattoo. Still think this has nothing to do with your fair? Correlation isn't causation, detective. You taught me that. Touche, Miss Hart. I have more to tell you about Mr. Scribb's death after the internal postmortem. As will I after a visit to your fair. Is that man deceased? Very much so, I'm afraid. He was found this morning, not too far from here. I'm sorry to hear that. Uh, but what does that have to do with me? Just to be clear, you don't recognize the man in this photograph. Um, this card was found at the scene of the crime. The death card does not mean actual death. It's symbolic of a change, an ending. Well, this man very much met his end. Mm. And this card appears to match your deck. I don't believe so. Well, then you won't mind checking to see if your death card is there? It's not possible. It's not there? No. When did you last see it? During a uh, reading last night before dinner. Who else has had access to this booth in the past 24 hours? Anyone else who works here, we don't feel the need to lock things up. <clears throat> Can you account for your whereabouts last night? I was at the hotel I had a late dinner with friends, and then I went to bed. Right. I'll need the name of the hotel and the restaurant. Would I really leave something at a crime scene that would lead police back to me? I'm being framed. That's a good point. But why would someone want to frame you for a murder of someone you don't know? 
I'm a psychic detective, but I don't have an answer for that. Hotel and restaurant, please. Oh, she just got a little bad news. <laughs> I need to speak with you about a murder. No, please, sit down. Uh, this won't take long. Your wife would want you to have a break. How did you know I have a wife? Well, I can see your love line on your palm all the way over here. Oh, and such beautiful children. You only have one. Not for long. <laughs> all right, just for a minute. My word, I've never seen anything like this. What? What's wrong? Wrong? <laughs> Your lifeline is nothing short of remarkable. My lifeline? Well, this here. You are going to live a very long and successful life. You going to be rich? Or famous? Both. And <gasps> no harm will ever come to you. Tell me more. <laughs> no. William? Oh, didn't expect to see you here, of all places. I didn't expect to be investigating a murder. Thank you. <clears throat> and to the nail in her right hand. Christmas, someone's looking to cop a mouse today. Who did that? Yeah, stop, stop. We are defending the faithful and rejecting the evil. We don't want you here. You have every right to express your concern, but violence of any sort will not be tolerated by the Toronto Constabulary. Is that understood? I apologize. Won't happen again. Is that a handcrafted apothecary? Want to take a peek inside? Very much so. <laughs> We've got some willow bark, whole cloves, rose hips, valerian, and as a thank you for your interest. I, I really couldn't. It's just a little dried lavender. Oh, how lovely. And we could put it in Susanna's crib. It might help her sleep. It will surely do that. Hmm. Hmm. While I have you here, do you recognize this man or his tattoo? No. I do know someone who can help you. Who? Charming in glass. She's covered in tattoos, and she's right inside. Oh. Thank you. Hello? I'm Detective Murdoch of the Toronto Constabulary. <gasps> Welcome. What would you like to see, know, or... Nice tattoo. <laughs> Which one? Going to need to be a little more specific. Perhaps we can get into more specifics down at the station house. Do you know this man? Erasmus Scribs. Back in our salad days. Dear Mussy. No longer on this mortal plane? No. He was found dead not too far from your fair. I knew him as Erasmus Galt many moons ago, but he had many lives and many names. He was a con man. Oh, he was much more than that. What was your relationship to him? We were followers of Alistair Crowley, members of the, the Pneumatic Order, or something like that. And did being part of this order require you to have the tattoo that I've observed on both his shoulder and yours? To show our fealty, our loyalty, yes. I see. Clearly, you are no longer part of the organization. Um, did you and Erasmus leave together? No. Mussy found God. He worried that being part of the order would hurt his chances of getting into heaven. I see. And where were you last night, between midnight and 6 a.m.? Keeping company with 
Horatio, a gentleman who sports the most glorious imperial mustache and coatie. Do you know of anyone who may have wished Erasmus harm? He had a wild life when I met him. It's possible he made enemies that found him here. I really couldn't say. Right. I'll be looking into your alibi, but uh, in the meantime, you are free to go. Bit of a peacock, that one, eh? She knew the victim. Do you think she killed him? I don't know, but I find her suspicious. Has an answer for everything. Well, she's a fortune teller, Murdoch. She probably knew what you were going to ask before you did. What have you, Miss Hart? I've completed the internal examination of the victim. The results are consistent with death from a fall from a great height. Hmm. Anything else? I did find chicken pot pie and tea in his small intestine. That's the meal we found in his apartment. There was one curious thing. Go on. His tea was made with hallucinogenic mushrooms. Which could have caused disorientation, vertigo. Again, this could be a death by misadventure. But there was a long horizontal bruise across his back. Even though there were no defensive wounds, what if he was facing a killer on the balcony? His back pressed against the handrail. He's been drugged, unsteady on his feet. One good push could have sent him off the balcony. Falling backwards and landing prostrate when he hit the ground. The killer then walked down the stairs into the alley and placed the tarot card on the body. But why the card? That's what I intend to find out. Oh, excellent work, Miss Hart. <sighs> a little bit more, please. And a little bit more lemon as well. Of course. The earthiness of the tea can take a little getting used to. Mm. I just want my family to be together. And for my son to make the right choices. You think he won't? <sighs> I don't know. Can you tell me? Of course. Stopped when you did. Looks like you got God on your side. God has nothing to do with it, Tucker. Nothing at all. No harm will ever come to me. What? Charles Brackenreed, Yorkshire accent. About this tall, but oh, wait. This tall? <gasps> Julia! <laughs> oh, Julia! Oh, oh my God, Julia! Hi, Hi Margaret. Hello, hello. Have I ever told you? Hello. Have I ever told you how wonderful I think it is that you are a doctor? A doctor! Margaret, well, your pupils are dilated. I think she's been drugged. Drugged? How? No! I simply had the most wonderful conversation with a tattoo lady, and everything is going to be fine! Charmian Glass at the Psychic Fair? Yes. And we had the most delicious tea. It just... Margaret, mm. what's going on? What are you doing here? Well... What are we all doing here is the question, isn't it? My office. Why? Ooh. 
<laughs> the tea is made from mushrooms with hallucinogenic compounds. We also found it in the victim's system. But nobody's trying to harm Margaret, surely. She didn't drink enough to cause harm. She said Charmian Glass gave it to her. The peacock you interviewed earlier. Detective. Our final sweep of the crime scene. We found this. Thank you. A coin or money of some sort? It seems familiar. A tiny hole on top would suggest it's a piece of costume jewelry. Faye Rattler's headdress. It was adorned with several of these flat discs. The tarot card reader. She's looking quite guilty. Between that and the death card on the victim's body, I'd say so, yes. But the tea in the victim's stomach came from Charmian Glass. Do you think the two women from the fair worked together to kill your victim? That's possible. What's their motive? Let's bring them in and find out. <laughs> Charmian Glass? You are under arrest for the murder of Erasmus Scribbs. Detective Murdoch, this is beginning to feel like a deja vu. What's going on out here? Apparently, I killed someone. <gasps> Sir. Very good. Faye Radler, you are also under arrest. What? For what charge? For conspiring to commit murder with Miss Glass. <sighs> Let's go. We don't need this evil in our city. Constable Higgins, shut down this event until further notice. What are you doing? You can't close the fair. That's exactly what I'm doing. Our Lord's work is done. The devil's playground is no more. Thank you. The devil is rebuked. Praise the Lord. Why did you serve drug tea to the police inspector's wife? I serve it to all my clients. I didn't know who that church bell was when she sat down. Why do you drug your customers? The tea helps them relax and open up. It's harmless. Well, it wasn't harmless to your friend, Mr. Scribbs. He had a large dose of it in his system when he was pushed off the balcony. Detective, how could a tiny woman like me hoist a grown man over a balcony. Obviously, you had help. Martha, gray as a mare, missing husband, wants him back. Well, she shouldn't. He's a cad. Sarah, mole on right cheek, lost her job, wants to move back to country. Some people should never leave the farm. Petey, gouty leg, dead wife. Everyone wants to hear from their departed loved ones. Everyone. So is this how you and Charmian deceived your customers? You learned personal information about them in town, shared it with one another, and then used it in your fortune-telling act? It's harder to do in cities this big. Better to stick to the small towns. So why did the two of you decide to kill a man? Did she serve him the tea and you pushed him off the balcony or vice versa? Char and me working together to kill someone. You've read too many Penny Dreadfuls, detective. You and Mr. Scribbs both had the same ring. <laughs> oh, Erasmus, you sentimental old fool. <laughs> How long were the two of you together? Married over seven years. And then what happened? You had a falling out? We didn't always agree on how to uh, run the business. You know, um, solve certain problems. You lied to me about not knowing him. I swear I had nothing to do with his death. We found this piece of your costume at the scene of the crime. How do you explain that? 
I, uh, I can't. Your alibi has been unsubstantiated, and all of the evidence is pointing towards you. I'm innocent. I swear it. Forgive me for being blunt, Miss Rattler, but your word means nothing. What did I tell you? Perhaps you were right. The fair did invite trouble. I don't believe those women killed anyone. Oh, neither do I. That reverend seems more capable of murder than those two. I agree. Didn't he knock over one of the vendor's displays? He did. What are you thinking? What if it was an act? A diversion to distract us from what he was really doing at the fair? What was he really doing? Stealing a card to frame someone for murder. I know what church he presides over. It's on Wellington. Well, let's go have a chat with him. Let's. You think these two women have been working together for years, just waiting for the right time to kill this fellow? If they knew Toronto was to be one of their stops, and that this Erasmus fellow resided here, then it's not beyond reason. Did they appear to be chummy to you? To be honest with you, no. And I've yet to find a reason why they would commit a crime together. Honor among thieves, I suppose. Sirs, uh, I managed to track down the mustachioed gentleman that Charmian kept company with last night. He confirms her alibi. Well then, that only leaves Faye Radler. I knew there was something off about you. Off? A judgmental hypocrite who's secretly a soaker. I am not. You have me all wrong. It's no wonder you burst into our place of business making yourself a nuisance. You were drunk on what? Moonshine? Violet, what is it? Cassie, call the station house and tell them I'm making a citizen's arrest. Arrest? For what? Murder. It's just tea. It's a fair bit more than that, Reverend. Now, where did you purchase this? At an apothecary on Birchgate Avenue. It's completely legal and less potent than opium. Why do you drink it? It's the only thing that alleviates my grief since my wife was murdered. Your wife was murdered? Yes, by a charlatan posing as a psychic. By chance, is this the man that you're referring to? That's him. I wanted him dead, and the Lord delivered. You say your wife was murdered by a charlatan. What do you mean by that? Our son died after a brief illness, and my wife never recovered. She met this man at a traveling fair who told her that she could speak to our child in the afterlife. And she believed him? Yes. She claimed to have heard his voice telling her that he was all right and begging her to keep coming back to talk to him. And she did? Till the money ran out, yes. And then they just tossed her aside. And when she could no longer talk to her son, she took her own life. They may as well have put the gun to her head. They? Crooks, thieves, scoundrels. Just one big flim-flam family profiting from people's grief. And this is guaranteed to put a little extra pep in my step. It will indeed, sir. So we're free to go? We've decided to release you, for now. For now? Too many Christmas. What more do we have to do to prove our innocence? It's standard procedure. Just don't leave town. Thank you, Detective. Miss Hart, these people, they prey on the weak. Does that not give you pause? Well, I have a lot of customers waiting to have their fortunes told. 
Excuse me. Detective Murdoch, how's that lavender working for your child? Oh, well, she's sleeping like a, like a baby. Glad to hear. How are you feeling now? Embarrassed. Thomas was right. It's all stuff and nonsense. Well, you couldn't have known the tea would have that effect on you. Why did you go back to the fair? I went to speak to the pyromancer. He said I had the gift. Then the fortune teller called out to me and... I should really get home. You sure you don't want to talk about it a little more? You're very kind, but... I need to get home and forget this day ever happened. I feel silly for having believed those people. Tucker, you call the station and let them know there's a robbery in progress at the corner of Nassau and Spadina. Well, what about you? He's got a gun. No harm will come to me. Hey. Stop! Police! Get away from me. No. What are you doing? My job. Get away. Get away! Ah! See? I'm gonna do it. <laughs> You're being charged with the murder of Erasmus Scribbs. Do you understand? I didn't kill him. But I'm happy he's dead. And for that, I should be punished. Sin is sin. But I look forward to being reunited with my family in death. you finished with me yet? I told you I was ready to accept my fate. Tell me in detail the events leading up to the death of your wife. It was over 10 years ago, but I remember it like it was yesterday. Erasmus posed as a psychic who could channel the dead, correct? Yes. And the woman would find vulnerable and grieving people listen to their sad stories and pass them on to him. He would use them in his readings. A woman would hide under a table or behind a curtain, pretending to be the dead relative. Do you know this for certain? I don't. But my wife described the voice of a child echoing out through the ethers reaching out to her from beyond the grave. She believed she was hearing your son, but you think it was this woman. My wife would have done anything to speak to her child again. That's why she trusted those charlatans. Oh, you made the papers. Nice work. Sir, I believe the Reverend is innocent. But it all adds up. Con man, dead wife, reverend gets revenge, case closed. Respectfully, sir, I have to disagree. How so? The reverend stated that his wife was conned by a husband and wife duo. And one of them is dead. And if the wife was the tarot card reader, we know that she didn't kill him. That leaves the reverend. What if a third person was involved in the scheme? Like who? The reverend said that his wife heard a child's voice. Her son speaking to her from beyond the grave. A dead child did it. I need to have another word with Faye Radler. You're back. I guess your curiosity got the better of you. Has Miss Radler returned? No, I haven't seen her. Uh, sir, I need a word with Mr. Salazar. Henry, does this have to do with the case? Uh, no, I just want to tell him he was right.
will only take but a moment, and it would really mean a lot to me. Very well. Thank you. Hope you get good news, fella. I already have. Me too. I have a remarkable lifeline, and no harm will ever come to me. Can you believe it? I'm gonna live forever. Mr. Salazar, a word. Oh. Hmm. The Five of Wands. They're healing from a conflict. Yes. We've been through battle. I certainly have. You'll come through triumphant. You really don't remember me, do you? Should I? Too many Christmas, Mama. How could you forget your own son? Derby, my sweet boy. So you do remember me. How could I forget? Tell me one thing you remember about me. You used to like salt water taffy. You couldn't get enough strawberry phosphates. One time you drank so much you had red stains around your mouth for days. <laughs> and you always gave me some of your supper because I was still hungry after cleaning my plate. You were a growing boy, of course. So why did you leave me? It was Erasmus's decision. But I was just a child. You were my mother. I wasn't your mother. You were a foundling. We took you in. You were still my mother. No, I wasn't. You were a means to an end. We owe you nothing. I lied for you. I deceived people for you. And Erasmus paid for that. You killed him. You two gave me a childhood, and you took it away from me. Can I go? I've done nothing wrong. Nothing I can arrest you for, but you've done plenty wrong. You've conned people, abandoned a child. The act we came up with couldn't have lasted indefinitely. When Derby no longer sounded like a child because he grew, you dropped it. We changed our act to two magnificent mentalists. But after a couple months, Erasmus didn't have the stomach for it. The incident with the Reverend's wife and her suicide gave him a conscience. Something that is not really an asset in this line of work. Thank you for saving my life. I'll be on my way. I'd best not ever see you in Toronto again, Miss Radler. So, what will happen to the young man? The circumstances of his life will likely spare him the noose. But he deceived me. He drove my wife to madness. He will spend considerable time behind bars. He was a child, Reverend. Simply doing the bidding of people who showed him a kindness. I understand. My wife couldn't get past our son's death. I couldn't get past my wife's suicide. And young Derby couldn't forgive what those two people did to him. None of them are easy tasks. No. No, they are not. I would like to speak to the young man, if I may. If he's willing. I would like him to know that I forgive him. So what you're telling me is you're not invulnerable. You walked straight towards a man who was shooting at me. So your fate isn't in your hands. Good one, Tucker. Thank the you. The thing is, he knew things. My marriage to Ruthie, the fact that I have a child, how could he know all that? He guess. 
just like it was luck that saved you from getting shot. Well, you won't see me risking my life anymore. Hooker! Are you all right? Uh. Never better. Well, I guess some people were just born lucky. Julia? It's Madame O to you, Detective. Oh. Where is Susanna? I tucked a sachet of that lavender under her pillow, and she's been sound asleep for hours. Perhaps it's not all smoke and mirrors after all. Well, knowing that, pick a card. See your future. Oh. <laughs> pick another. It must be written in the stars. <laughs> That's the spirit. <laughs> What's with the getup? <sighs> Going out for a run. A run? Where? Just a run, Margaret. Around and around. Ever since I got the pep tonic from that young lad, I've been full of beans. Be ready for me when I get back. Oh, <laughs> seen so many trees. Where are you headed? North. Ah, myself as well. You spent much time up here? A fair bit. Not me. It is a long ride, isn't it? Very long. I'm so pleased you're here, Julia. You haven't been to a suffrage society meeting in quite some time. Well, one does get discouraged after years of protest resulting in no change. Mm. You seem in high spirits this morning. I spoke with George last night. He got a tip about his father from one of George Sr.'s associates. Is his father still wanted for murder by the Winnipeg police? Yes, but George hopes to get to him first, and with any luck, he'll sort it out and come home to me. Well, I wish him the best of luck. Oh, Marianne. Good morning, Julia. This is Cobb G. I, uh, I trust you're both ready for the march on the legislature? Yes, of course. Oh, and since yellow is the color of the movement, I thought perhaps we could wear daffodils to the demonstration. <sighs> A fine idea. <laughs> Everything all right, Marianne? Uh, would we be able to have a word after the meeting? I'm embarrassed to ask for help, but... I don't know where else to turn. I'm looking for my father. I'm looking for a friend. Looking for my... Freddy is a wonderful chap, but hasn't been in touch in a while, and I, I worry about him. Well, let's just say he can get into a mood now and then, and when he gets into a mood, he tends to get into a scrape, and... I'm hoping I'll find him soon. Timing couldn't be worse. My wife and I just bought a house. Listen, friend. Best to keep your mouth shut on this train.
something, please? Good God! Is he dead? I'm afraid so. He's been stabbed through the heart. Do you have a passenger list? No, not, not on this train. Well, this man's with the Winnipeg Police Force, and his killer's aboard this train. Police? Look, I'm a member of the Toronto Constabulary myself. I can offer assistance. No, no, no. I'll inform the local officials at the next stop. Well, we can't leave him here. This laboratory needs to be closed off. Do you know if he had any luggage with him? I think he had a small case of the seat. I can get it. Well, that's all right. I'll manage. You should get back to the passengers. The man who was sitting here earlier? Could be yes, could be no. Well, which is it? Last I seen him, he was heading for the back of the train. Is that the baggage car? Could be yes, could, could be, be no. I understand you could use my help, Mrs. Shaysworth. It's humiliating to admit. My husband has deserted our family. I'm sorry to hear that. Thank you. It's not that I miss him. I must say I don't. But the children and I will lose our lodgings. In cases like this, sometimes an intermediary can work out some kind of arrangement. And your husband has definitively stated that he will not support you and your children? Well, I'd ask him. But he's disappeared. And you believe he's at this men's club? It, yes, I, I have a photo, if it helps. She's already tried his place of work. He's a stockbroker at the exchange. Would you be kind enough to check his men's club, detective? I'll do what I can. Good morning. Detective William Murdoch, Toronto Constabulary. Are you Herman Chainsworth? The man himself. Some might consider it a tad early in the day to indulge. Some might pity the poor saps forced to hew to a conventional schedule. Now I do. Sir, I understand you have decided to desert your family. I'm not paying. Are you saying that you refuse to take responsibility for the welfare of your wife and your children? Why should I pay for the privilege of being henpecked day and night, year after year? <clears throat> Please, Herman, some decorum. Apologies, Mr. Mutz. Sir, you're not permitted in there. Isn't it just a baggage car? Yes, sir, but there are no passengers allowed for your safety. I understand. Apologies. the delegation to the legislature. The Premier refused to receive us. We only made it as far as the foyer. But we did force him to listen to our demands. Uh, well, he listened, and he'll do nothing. I met with Mr. Shainsworth earlier today, and he refuses to pay to support his children. You couldn't convince him. He seemed quite defiant. I did, however, obtain his address, and I've passed that on to Mrs. Shainsworth. Really? Apparently a lodging house nearby. Detective Murdoch? 
Oh. Where? All right. What's going on? I'm afraid Mr. Shainsworth has been found murdered. Calm down. Look at him. Uh, robber of whist to pass the time, is it, folks? Poker. The game's full up. That's some uh, lively stakes you're using there. A race. Did anybody notice there was a lawman on the train? Most of us don't take kindly to lawmen. If you know what I mean. Yes, that's why I say to be, to be aware on guard, if you will. Is that why you're back here? Because the porter's paid to keep people out. Well, as I said, I'm looking for a friend. I call. Yep, 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 yep. Surely we're not there yet. This is my stop. So why don't you come along? I have a feeling I can help you find who you're looking for. This is one trip you got to pay for. Well, I did pay. I can show you my ticket. I'm not talking about the train. I'm talking about the trip to nowhere. Looks like your trip ends here. Brothers, leave off. Forge. Name's Forge. Don't you forget it. Now shut the hell up and come with me. What's your interest here? I don't like mess. I don't like cleanup. And don't forget the rules. <laughs> All right, Forge. I can respect my elders. Forge? Forge Farrar. The Iron Scourge, they call me. Yeah! <laughs> On foot from here. You heard him. Get the bus. I think we can talk now. What are you doing here? Came looking for you. Listen, a lawman was killed on that train, and he had this on him. That's not good. There's no time to lose if the police are this close. What are you doing here? I have to clear my name, George. I'm tracking the man who killed my business partner, Sidney McRae. So you didn't do it? Of course not. Sid was a friend, a banker who was staking my new project, a healing spa at Little Manitou Lake in Saskatchewan. That's your new scheme? A spa in Saskatchewan? It's the Dead Sea of Canada. The minerals in the water, lithium, sulfur, magnesium, they're therapeutic for all manner of ailments of body and mind. Does sound nice. It's an incredible opportunity. Sid was helping to raise more capital. It's dreadful what happened to him. What did happen to him? Starting to think you two know one another. Is this the friend you were looking for? Yes. Why don't you say so? Move along. Nothing to see here. Grim place to breathe one's last. I was with Mr. Shainsworth only this morning. He was in high spirits of a sort. Murder weapon doesn't appear to have been discarded here. 
His trousers are unbuttoned. I believe he may have stopped to relieve himself in this alley. He was staying just next door. A predilection of the inebriated, I'm afraid. Yes, well, I can attest he began drinking early today. I heard that he had his back to his attacker when he was struck. And if he was intoxicated, his assailant would have had the advantage. I'll pay a visit to his club to reconstruct his movements. Oh, his wallet is here. It's empty. Do we believe he was robbed? Possibly. Although I wouldn't rule out the possibility of a more personal motive. Hmm. Welcome to nowhere. What is this place? A group of prospectors set it up when they hit a vein of silver. Or thought they had. This is mining country up here. Precious metals are magnetic for big dreamers. I'm surprised the Iron Scourge is so fond of flights of fancy. <laughs> You'll find I'm full of surprises. Most of them nasty. <laughs> <laughs> Good Lord. It happens now. We gotta meet the mayor. He decides on who stays and who goes. Frank Henshaw. This is Buck. Buck. Got a last name? Uh, Buck. Huck. Uh, Huckles. Hucklesworth. Hucklesberry. Huckleberry. Huckleberry. Well, Mr. Huckleberry. Just call me Buck. Buck. Most current folk who live here, ghosts, I call them. Or retired, or reformed, or plain need to disappear for one reason or another. And there's rules, too. No real names, settle your own scores, but no killing alive. Well, I think I can handle that. Someone's got to vouch for you. That'd be me. Sign here. Son, you don't know what you've walked into here. But I'm touched you came looking. Well, of course I did. I was worried. Why do the police think you killed your business partner? We'd argued publicly. Sid was wavering on our project. His colleagues were pushing him into investing in local real estate instead. So he was backing out? Not at all. In fact, I was going to meet him to confirm our deal on the day he was killed. But he was dead when I got to his office. Bludgeoned. And the timber bonds he'd promised to invest were gone. Why did you run? You must have known how that would look. I panicked. I'd been seen on the way in. So I slipped away. Since then, I've laid low and traced the bonds to this strange place. Is that the whole truth? I know you struggle with these dark moods. It isn't like that. I've taken the waters all over the continent, and it has changed my life. I'm changed. Then what about the McCray file? The detectives found your cane in the room, along with your finger marks on the murder weapon, the, the, the stone paperweight. Well, certainly. I'd handle it on many occasions. Tyndall stone, full of fossils, a remarkable specimen. Yes, well, remarkably deadly, as it turns out. There was another set of unknown finger marks on the weapon. Perhaps we can use that to identify the real killer, if we can even find ourselves a suspect. No need. I found an ally here, the manager of the local drinking hall. Polly has promised to help me find the man I'm tracking. Oh, you're going to love her. Back. I'd like you to meet Polly. Dorothy? George! Father, that's Dorothy Earl. She's a murderous psychopath. She's using you to get to me. Father? Well, there's no need to overreact. Neither of us knew each other's true identity. Every ghost in nowhere has an alias. No, I don't believe you. You always said you weren't finished with me. Maybe I'm interested in starting over. Amelia's gone. And though I blame you, George, the fact is, my sister was very troubled, and I've put in the pass, and I am committed to helping Forge. Maybe she deserves a second chance. 
I'm terribly <laughs> sorry for your loss. The finality of death can sometimes summon unresolved feelings. I know my feelings for my miserable louse of a husband very well. I'm only worried about telling the children that they no longer have a father. If I may, where were you earlier today? I was at a suffragist rally that I helped organize. I've campaigned for years to get women the vote, and it can't happen soon enough. Too much in this world depends upon the whims of men. Feeling better after a night's sleep? No. Listen, we cannot trust Dorothy. She is a criminal and a liar. So is everyone else around here. Besides, Polly at least already knows who we are, and she wants to help. Yeah, help us into an early grave, more like. Look, we could leave this place now. You could turn yourself in if you would help plead your case. George, no one will believe me innocent. I'm a fugitive. And I'm the only one who's absolutely certain I didn't do it. I need to find the real killer. There's another clue in the McCray fella. He had a meeting scheduled right before he was to meet with you. A man by the name of Eugene Flett. The police ever interview him? No, they couldn't find him. Seems like a reasonable suspect. Well, that's the spirit. Between the three of us, we'll get our man. Sorry of us. Oh. Running a successful establishment in a town that does not exist is harder than you might think. Well, it's a shame about your business, Rose. What about the help you promised us? Patient. Young buck. Oh. Ghosts have arrived in the last three months. This is Clutch! He used to be a thief. Clutch, this is Forge, and Buck. They have some questions for you. Mayor said we'd have no truck with questions. Yes, and as the mayor's right hand, I am telling you to answer anyway. Have you spent any time in Winnipeg? No. Nah. What about timber bonds? Have you seen any circulating around nowhere? If I had a, I would have stolen them for sure. That it? Well, that wasn't terribly enlightening. My whip! I told you he was a thief. Well, now, if it isn't Forge and his best bud. Just, uh, cleaning some bullets, are we? Polly said to help you. So start talking. We're wondering if you've spent any time in Winnipeg, or do you know if any of the other ghosts have? No, indeed. But then I don't ask a lot of questions. I like living too much for that. I like your hat. Popular style out west. Shot a man for it. Perhaps he was from out west. What about Eugene Flett? Do you know anybody by that name? What a coincidence. That was the name of the man with the hat. <laughs> Hello there. Are you a Yankee? Yeah. I hear you're a former pickpocket. Sure, I've been a dipper. What of it? I've always admired fine finger work. You know, real hard to make a living once the coppers know your face. They're always running. I wonder did you know a friend of mine? Name is Sid, out in the peg. No, I ain't never been out west. It's terrific. <laughs> Marvelous, what you show me? I must have dipped some interesting things here or nowhere. Nah, not much scratch around these parts. 
Though I uh, almost looked at some uh, funny looking paper money from Mayor Henshaw this week. Lumber bond or some such. Thank you so much. So we know that the murder occurred shortly after Mrs. Shainsworth learned where her husband was staying. Julia told me that Mrs. Shainsworth did not meet up with the suffragette delegation, even though she was meant to lead it. But she was seen at the men's club. Apparently, she pushed past the doorman and argued with her husband before being ejected. Shainsworth himself left shortly thereafter. And perhaps he went straight back to his lodgings where he was accosted by someone in the alley. By someone named Mrs. Shainsworth? Let's see what Mayor Henshaw has to say about these timber bonds. I don't see how Henshaw could have killed Sid. I thought he'd been here for years. Mayor! Mayor Henshaw! He's dead. What? Hey! What did you do to the mayor? Hey! Hey, they killed him! You'll pay for this. I thought there was no killing in nowhere. Hey! That's Ford's whip around his neck. This is what Mayor Henshaw didn't want. Another lawless town of bandits settling scores. You're making a mistake. We're innocent and we can prove it. He's the one who stole Forge's whip. No, we got eyes. We see what's what. I'll show you what it means to be a ghost. Wait, wait, wait a minute. What, what about the rule? No killing in nowhere. Hey, hey, hands off these two. By order of the mayor. Go. You're welcome. Let's go. Inside. She planned this. She planned to kill Henshaw so she could blame us. It's sheer luck that you were after the same person. Well, they couldn't have overpowered Henshaw. Anyone here could have done it. Have you ever considered she might truly be reformed? Father, you don't understand the half. This woman is rotten to the core. The things that she has done to me, the things she's done to my wife, her brain is, is, is broken. Is that what you think of me? People can heal. They can learn. Are you honestly telling me you think people are incapable of change, George? Finger mark that whip. Oops. I know you're behind this. It is flattering how much credit you give me. You know, Polly was with us nearly the whole time. Nearly being the operative word. I'm not guilty of anything. Have a look around as much as you like. Please tell me where you went after you confronted your husband at the men's club. Did you wait for him outside of his lodgings? No, I went home alone to see which of my belongings I could sell to make up the rent. I hope for your sake that you're telling me the truth. But I have a feeling that you haven't finished lying to me yet. May I have a moment alone with my client, please? Is there something you're not telling me? Be honest so I can help you. I can't. It's not a match. Mayor Hinchas' finger marks don't match those on the paperweight that killed Sidney McRae. So your friend's killer is still out there. Then how did Henshaw get hold of the timber bonds? Maybe Yankee lied to us at Dorothy's behest. If Polly, Dorothy, really did kill the mayor, then I've put you in terrible danger. You should go. I'm not leaving you. I don't deserve your help. I should have listened. I should have believed you. It's not your fault. She's fooled 
many people. And I came to help you, whether you were innocent or not. That's what family does. You'll make a fine father one day, George. The kind I wish I'd been for you. Thank you. We have the finger marks for whoever killed McCray. If there was just some way to check them against every suspect in town. I've got an idea. <laughs> you must be preoccupied with mayoral matters now. It's a shame you're tied to the bar all night. It's impossible to find good help around here. Well, I'd like to buy the entire bar a drink. <laughs> I'll play Berman for the evening. I am grateful that you came to our defense earlier. I'll help, too. I'm going to need a new trade if I stick around. Wait, you're staying? Yeah. Well, it suits me fine. Just, um, make sure you water down the drinks or else it'll cost me in chairs. <laughs> hey, you are, sir. Thank you. Sit with us, Forge. Don't mind if I do. What are we celebrating? Ah, uh, there's a mill in the next railway town. Shut down without enough folks to run it. I thought we could get it going, get some jobs for folks around here. Remarkable. I'm done messing with the law. I just want to live in peace. As do we all. I do. You know, the first of us in nowhere were cons running off from work games. Escaped prisoners. Forced to build the railway. Nowhere is a fascinating experiment. Freedom, self-governance, and a potential means of peaceable industry and rehabilitation. What do you know about all of that? I've dabbled in city planning myself, imagining new ways of living and bringing people together. Of course, I had to cut down any bureaucrat who got in my way. If they said, show me your permit, I said, permit me to introduce you to my business partner, Mr. Colt. <laughs> Please tell the detective what you just told me. I, I didn't kill Herman. But there is something I haven't confessed. Our marriage wasn't legal. Oh? Mr. Shainsworth walked out on his previous wife years ago, but he didn't divorce her. With Herman dead, I stood to collect nothing, not to mention the damage to my reputation. Why did you persist in this arrangement? I was young, and I fancied myself in love. And before long, I had children to protect. I'll look into who else may have had motive to harm him. Perhaps someone at his work. I've heard the stock exchange can be a cutthroat business. It's true. But Herman had a talent for making enemies everywhere. Imagine a saltwater lake fed by an underground spring. The water is full of minerals. Have you ever been swimming in a saltwater lake? You actually float. It's a bit of heaven on earth. <laughs> I found a match. It's Brewis. He's the one who killed McCray. He's gone. We can get him in the morning. I'm afraid I've, I've had a few too many sets tonight. I thought you only ever pretended to drink. There's no fool in this crowd. told you, Dorothy Ernst has known who you really are all along. The woman who I spoke to on the telephone, she said she was your assistant. She said her name was Aileen Smart. Aileen Smart? 
I don't know anyone by that name. I never told a soul I was coming. Last time you threatened me or anybody I care about. What are you so worked up about, George? I'm not threatening anyone. I'm working. You lured me here to nowhere. Weren't you looking for your father? Weren't you concerned for him? I could have hardly have given you my real name. You would not have believed me. Don't, don't twist things around. What are you gonna do? You're gonna kill me? Of course not. But I am going to bring you to justice. How long have you known who I really am? A few weeks. Having a brillis killed your partner in Winnipeg. His real name is Eugene. He's trying to sell land to your friend. And Sid didn't want it. Oh, if it even existed. <laughs> brillis went in with the con. Saw a chance to score. All those bonds. You see, I know everything that happens in this town, including the fact that there's silver to be found. I thought there was no silver. Well, the first prospectors gave up too soon. This town has the potential to be something. And I'm going to be in the center of it all. Is that why you killed Mayor Henshaw? He wouldn't step down for you. Well, you know me so well, Georgie. But no. I did not kill Henshaw. Brillis took care of it. Did he kill the Winnipeg lawman on the train as well? Probably. He is a bit of a brute. <laughs> but really, the nerve of Henshaw trying to cling to power and refusing my generous bribe of timber bonds. <sighs> Brillis shared everything when he fell in love. I'm a little bit like George, you see. I have a gift for making people Obsessed with me. You still with that lawyer? Don't even say her name. Effie! Oh, no! Effie, Effie, Effie! It's a shame she won't be here to see me kill you. Your father will just have to watch instead, which is also a shame. Because I really liked you, me old George. And humor me, Dorothy. Why don't you two take this outside? Make it a real duel. It's almost dawn. Give the boy a fighting chance. Aren't you the mayor now? Show these ghosts your power and your fairness. That is an amazing idea. <laughs> Pistols at dawn! I will reload the weapons. <laughs> You will, will you? Dueling rules still apply, after all. I am the only second here, but you can watch me do it. is better than none. I truly admire your vision for nowhere. 
I've always been one for building things. Hmm. The world never goes easy on dreamers. And even harder on women, I'd guess. Charm. Right. You know what to do, my son. think of anything. I managed to find a broker who recognized the photograph. He says Shanesworth was dismissed from his firm weeks ago, and he asked if he owed me money as well. Shanesworth had other debts. It appears so. Some of his creditors came calling, and they weren't happy. So he had other enemies beside his wife, and if his creditors came looking for him here. That means they didn't know where he was staying. Who else knew of his temporary lodgings, then? Mr. Mupps. Detectives, you keep showing up here. Looking for a membership sponsor? Oh, no, I don't think this is a club we'd care to join. I understand you like to extend favors from time to time, Mr. Mupps. You loaned a great deal of money to Mr. Shanesworth. What of it? He'd lost money on the market, including mine. He said with some more, he could get it all back. But he didn't. You wanted repayment. You overheard me trying to get funds out of him for his family. And you feared Shanesworth would soon be repaying other debts before yours and tried to move to the front of the line. No, no, sir. Oh, uh, perhaps you lost your temper when you learned there was little hope of getting your money back? No. You overheard where he was staying. You waited for him outside of his lodgings, and when he stepped into the alley, you attacked him. You are under arrest, Mr. Mupps. I will drop this kerchief on the count of three. That will be the signal to fire. One. Two. Ha! No. No! No, 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 no! What about honor? You're looking in the wrong place for that, Dorothy. This is nowhere, remember? No, no. Tie her up. No, no! Oh, my gosh. You were never in any real danger. You took her bullets using Yankee sleight of hand for I'm a man of many talents. Right now, we have to get to the train and get Dorothy to justice. What about Brillis? We'll have the authorities return for him. Right now, the most important thing is to get this menace of a woman behind bars. Oh, oh, thank you, Mother! We have to get out of here! Just leave him! Go, go, go! Get the wagon! That boy is some Pardon me? No! No! no. What a terribly terrific escape! The town is completely deserted. Anyone that was there is long gone. But they'll find them. Thank you, Detective. And I appreciate you liaising with the Winnipeg Police Force. The evidence of the finger-marked glass and the sworn affidavit of one Constable George Crabtree was what was needed to convince them. I've even communicated with the bank that issued the timber bonds, and Sid had already put them in my name. So he truly did believe in the project? Of course. And there's still a good sum remaining. I'm off to Saskatchewan to take the waters and to get this spa off the ground. Well, best of luck. I suppose it'll be a while before I see you again. Hard to say. We crab trees could hardly be called predictable. <laughs> you keep yourself out of trouble now. I'll take that as a solemn order, son. Farewell. George. Effie. Perhaps we should leave these two alone? I am never letting you out of my sight again. No, don't worry. I'm not going nowhere.
tell you, I've never seen one quite so crispy before. Henry, please, let's show some respect. Indeed, crispy really isn't the word, Constable Higgins. I suppose you're right, there's hardly any skin left on him. I'm told you were also in the shed earlier today, Mr. Beesbrook. Leonard Beesbrook. And if I'd been there an hour earlier, it would have been me. Any idea as to the identity of the remains? It would be those of Dr. Eaker. I take he was a professor at the university. He was the dean of science. Did you and Dr. Eaker cross paths this morning? Only for a brief moment, as I was leaving to meet a friend for lunch. By the time I turned, the shed was ablaze. Right. If you could come this way, please. Henry? Constable Higgins Newsom. Hmm? If you could please finish taking Miss Breeze Brooks' statement. Of course, sir. It's just starting to get good. Right this way. Anything of note with the body's heart? Oh, I'll have to do a more thorough examination. But there are no signs of trauma to the body beyond burns. Uh, it's possible the victim's death was just a tragic accident. I'm not so sure about that. You see this darker mark through here? Some sort of serpentine pattern. What is it? it? May indicate the presence of chemical accelerant. The fire was set intentionally. It's possible. And if so, who started it? How long had you been Dr. Eaker's secretary, Miss Kent? Three years. Uh, although I was to transfer to the Dean of Arts office next week. What was the reason for the change? Uh, time to broaden my horizons is all. Um, I draw, so art seemed like a good fit for me. Do you know of anyone who may have wished the Dean dead? He had his fair share of detractors, though that's not uncommon for someone in such a powerful position. Anyone specific come to mind? Well, he did recently face a challenge to his deanship from Dimitri Laflamme. It's nasty business. This Laflamme is also a professor here at the university? Yes. He specializes in pyrology. Py pyrology? The scientific study of fire? Exactly. I think I would very much like to speak with this Dr. Laflamme. Be down this hall. Then we go right and then a left and then a right. Thank you. Have you been able to confirm Mr. Beesbrook's alibi, Henry? Uh, alibi, sir? Oh, <laughs> yes, actually. The friend that Beesbrook lunched with, that they were together from 12 to 1. You seem distracted, Henry, more so than usual. Uh, it's this book, sir. I can't put it down. I don't recall you being much of a reader. I'm not. But, but Ruth's social calendar is bursting at the seams as late, and I've needed something to fill the many, many hours I've been home on with Jordan. I see. I didn't expect it to be such a thrilling pastime, sir. I'm even going to hear the author read later, which means I have only six hours left to finish his book. Be that as it may, you are on duty. So perhaps for the next five and a half hours, we could focus on the task at hand. I'll do my best, sir. Dr. Laflamme? You can't have gone far, sir. That tea's still piping, huh? What do we have here? Henry, there are enough accelerants here to burn down the entire university. Who in the blazes are you? Dimitri Laflamme, presume? Not much of a presumption. What would my name on the door? Um, Detective William Rock, Toronto Constabulary. We have a few questions for you. What sort of questions? The sort of questions that would be best answered at my place of work. Your place of work? Well, you mean the police station? Very good. Shall we? As if summoned on some kind of master, the roaches and bees rose from their nests and hives, by ground and by air. They stalked relentlessly towards small and unassuming man destined to soon become food for the worms. <laughs> I'm right if you want to learn how it all ends, you have to pony up a doll for your own copy. <laughs> Bzzz. <laughs>
<laughs> Isn't he something? Oh. Isn't he something? Oh, he certainly is. I know you. Not fully, no, I'm Clark Kent. Oh. I'm, um, uh, I was Dr. Eker's secretary. Oh, yes. I have him to blame for not yet finishing Eyes of the Arthropods. I must say, it was wonderful to hear it read out loud. So much, um, less labor intensive. I may even come again tomorrow night. <laughs> Personally, I wonder if Mr. Winsheen has lost his knack for it. And what's that, Miss? Cornelia Sweet. But this new story just seems so improbable. Insects branded as weapons? I wouldn't say that it's improbable. Any creature can be trained, can they not? The only reason I can think for you to drag me in here because you have heard of my dislike of Dean Kerr. I did, but I thought I should hear from you on the subject. <sighs> the man was fossil, for starters. By that, I take it you mean old-fashioned. Is that why you challenged his deanship? It wasn't only that. Iker's antiquated ways were holding the university back. In what way? In every way. Most relevant to myself. He refused a young woman admission into the graduate program on the basis of sex alone. As far as I can tell. How is that relevant to you? I was hoping to supervise a worker. She was brilliant. A fascinating idea about extinguishing fires with the use of flu gas. See, I admit to wanting Iker's job. I even admit to strongly disliking the man. But I did not kill him. What have you, Miss Hart? Results of my preliminary bed work. I thought you should see right away. Results show lethal levels of aptoxin in system. Dr. Eker didn't die in the fire? No. Have a look at this. Oh, something seems to have been left behind in there. Move it to be a stinger. Dr. Eker was killed by a bee sting? Multiple bee stings. Judging by the amount of aptoxin in his blood, he was stung hundreds of times. Where you're going, Dr. Upton. I'm sorry, I was engrossed. Engrossed? In a book? Yes. Why does everyone think it's so strange? Oh, I just never took you for a reader. You and the rest of the world. I'll have you know I read at a very early age. Oh, really? How young? Eleven. Oh. <laughs> oh. That's not... You have a lovely day. Oh, you as well. <laughs> Oh, oh Beesbrook, hello. Constable Higgins missing? All right. Well, I know you. Miss Sweet, what an unusual costume. Are you a performer of some kind? Oh, goodness, no. <laughs> I'm a vendor. Today is my first time selling in a market, and I thought that I should dress the part. Honey, uh, you're a beekeeper. Oh, I don't think I've earned that title yet. You see, some bees took up residence in my barn this spring, and I just couldn't bear to have them exterminated. Uh, even after the evil they do in Rise of the Arthropods? Well, that's nothing but fiction. <laughs> Based on fact, according to what Mr. Winged Sheen said last night. Here, allow me. What a dear you are. Thank you. I insist you must try some of my honey. So thank you. Oh, well, I don't have anything. Do you have a spoon? <laughs> Silly goose, you have fingers. You just twirl it around. Mm. Easy as pie. See? Try it. Oh! So, the professor's death wasn't a murder after all. 
I've spoken with Mr. Beesbrook, and he confirmed there was indeed a kerosene lantern in the shed. It was likely the cause of the burn marks that I took as evidence of an accelerant. What a way to go, bees. Indeed, though I would argue being burnt alive is equally bad. Well, you're not wrong there, Blocka. So, sir, I take it you approve of me releasing Dr. Laflamme? Of course. Not to wrap a case up quickly for change. Sirs, I think it's just called. Another person's been stung to death. Julia, what are you? I was shopping. Statements. Did you see what happened? I did. It was almost biblical. Biblical? In what way? They're like the locusts in Egypt. Oh, Miss Kent? Is it a surprise? It's like a big nightmare, more like it. Dr. Eker, and now Miss Kuspinski. You're familiar with this victim as well? Yes, we work together at Knowing Nader. You work at a magazine alongside your duties at the university? As a volunteer, yes. Uh, Miss Kuznicki, she was the editor, and I drew the illustrations, and we came here to gather more subscribers, and then she was just, she was swarmed out of nowhere. I see. I saw it myself, sir. She tried desperately to swat them away, but it didn't work. They were only after her, sir. Ooh. Julia? Yes, it's true. I saw it as well. We will take it from here, Miss Kent. They were only after her. That's not possible, Julia. Well, then Henry and I saw the impossible. William, I must go. I'm off to the morgue. Miss Hart has ordered the supplies for me. Good luck. Oh! Mr. Higgs, isn't it just awful? Uh, sir, this is Cornelia Sweet. We met last night at the author talk I mentioned. Uh, did you know Miss Plisbicki well, Miss Sweet? No, no, we never met. But she must have been stung dozens of times. That's a lot of bees for a colony to lose. Do you have any idea what would cause bees to attack like this? No. I've always found that if you don't bother bees, they don't bother you. Despite the way Mr. Winged Sheen characterizes them in his new book. Mr. Winged Sheen? The author I've been telling you about, sir? Come think of it, sir. If anyone can help with this case, it'll be him. Dr. Arthropodium had raised an army of insects and now he was ready to destroy his enemies. I'm sorry. I'm afraid there may be a misunderstanding. And why is that? Well, your book, it's a fantasy. <laughs> now, all my work is based on scientific fact. It's a point of pride. I see. Well, then, tell me. What causes bees to attack en masse? <laughs> Several such occasions in my newest book, when a scientist, Dr. Arthropodium. That's right, Dr. Arthropodium. He, well, he raises them. How exactly does he do that? P perhaps a better way to describe my work is inspired by fact. But I maintain I can be of assistance in your investigation. Well, then perhaps you can do so by pointing me to the set of facts that inspired the swarm of bees in the book. Of course, yes. Um, uh, let me think. I, I, you know, uh, perhaps I uh, misspoke. Busy day, it seems. Yes, sir. Uh, thank you, Mr. Winged Gene. This has been uh, illuminating. My office now. I'm bringing him with you. Explain yourself. I, I merely granted an interview. Yes. And now people believe we're in the midst of some sort of bee invasion. Mr. Winged Gene, why would you grant an interview like this? Well, I saw it as my duty. If the effects of my book are coming to fruition, it's, it's only right I, I warn the public. But as we've discussed, your book is a work of fiction. Or could it perhaps be prophetic? How about this for a prophecy? 
You give one more interview, and you'll find yourself behind bars. Now get out of my station house. I need a drink. So what's the plan? Plan, sir? To deal with the bees. This is hardly a police matter. These deaths can't be considered murder. The only way that people will calm down is if we can give them an explanation. And you, my old mucker, are the man for the job. Couldn't you have brought another constable along? Sir, I don't like bees, especially after reading that book. There's no reason to be concerned, Henry. Besides, everyone else had their hands full. My hands were full too, sir. I've still got cramps in them all the statements I've been taking. Do you really think that the bees are rising up in Mr. Winghead Sheen's jest? Finally, an expert opinion, sir. I told you before, Clara, there's nothing to worry about. Thank you, Miss Kent. Between eager breaking her heart, her friend's death, and that author running people up, poor Clara doesn't know what to believe. Oh, she and Dr. Eaker were courting? Not publicly. And he'd ended things recently, which is why she's changing jobs. But I suspect you're not here to talk about departmental drama. Indeed not. We're hoping you can shed some light on these recent attacks. I have a meeting to get to, gentlemen. But whatever I can do to help. Yes. Do you have any idea what could be causing these bees to behave so aggressively? Aggression isn't my area of expertise. But Based on what Claire told me about Miss Plavinsky's death, I do believe it could be alarm substance response. Oh, what's that? And how do we stop it? Bees secrete various chemical factors as a means of communicating. They can tell each other everything from location of the queen to the best place to find nectar. Including where to swarm? Not exactly. Alarm substance response can alert bees to danger. And yes, if there are enough nearby, it could cause a swarm to form. Is there any way to detect this chemical substance? It's invisible to the naked eye, but it does have a sort of sweet banana smell to it. Excuse me, gentlemen, I, I really have to go. Yes. Thank you, Mr. Beesbrook. This has been most helpful. We need to return to that market. If we were able to locate a beehive, that would help explain why Miss Plasbinski was attacked. Well, sir, if that's the case, I have one final question for Mr. Beesbrook. Anything? I, I don't think that will be necessary, Henry. Well, I think you'll think differently if we find a hive around here. Something which is seeming less and less likely every minute. We've seen no sign of a beehive anywhere. Well, sir, I don't know what to tell you. This is the place. Whoa. Whoa. What is it? it smells sweeter. It's the alarm substance response. The bees are coming. Henry, it's been hours since the attack. I really don't think that the substance would still be potent. It smells sweet, and it is sticky. Do you really think this is the substance Mr. Beesbrook was talking about? What else would it be, sir? Any idea? Dispersion suggests a sort of spray. And the sweetness reminds me. I did detect a similar scent while preparing Miss Plazinski's body. At the time, I presumed it was her perfume, but perhaps I was wrong. It has the same sweet smell. There appears to be a spot of discoloration right here on the fabric. Is there any way of determining exactly what that is? Presuming it was the same substance as on the magazine, the physical quality suggested some sort of starch. A few drops of iodine would confirm as much. Ah, indeed. Hmm. Just as we expected, it's some sort of fruit or vegetable. I can run some more tests to discover which one. That won't be necessary. Why not? Because I believe it to be banana. Bananas? It is the alarm response substance. No, the alarm response substance isn't banana, Henry. But it is possible someone has made a synthesized version of it. So the villain is using bees murder weapons? It's exactly like the way said. That's... that's not possible. I didn't believe it was possible either, Miss Hart. Until now. You'll change your mind? The fact that we've discovered banana scent on our victim's clothing uh, Mr. Beesbrook told me that when a bee stings, it releases a chemical that is somewhat akin to banana. Fascinating. Horrifying. In either case, 
The scent is a sort of call to the cavalry that forces all of the other bees nearby to become aggressive. How could someone make a static version of that? I don't know, but I suppose it's possible, given the right compounds. That's true. One would simply need to boil bananas and their peels, and over time, the essence would be transferred into the water. Then load that water into an atomizer, and the killer would then be able to direct the bees at whatever target he chooses. A million little murderers. But who on earth would go to all that trouble? It's a remarkable look, Mr. Wing and Sheen. It's almost as if you predicted the future. Some might even say I'm a modern Nostradamus. I wouldn't, of course, but I don't mind if you do. Oh. Thank you, dear. I'll treasure it. I've brought you something also. Oh. I'm hoping it'll be enough for you to sign. Oh, uh. Why, this is my entire catalog. I better get to it. Um, your name? Uh, Miss Cornelia Sweet. Ah, lovely. Can we see you here again? Well, I am a longtime fan, and that doesn't change simply because I take issue with his last book. You won't be taking issue with it for very long. Well, why do you say that? Well, there you are. Book signing is over. But I've kept my word and given a single interview. What cause do you have to interrupt my time with my admirers? Suspicion of murder. What? This is an outrage. I wonder what your admirers have to say about this. Uh, 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 I've never seen it in my life. Sounds like more of your fiction, Miss Winged Sheen. Henry? No. You said it yourself, my books are fiction. I had no idea banana could spur bees into attacking. Your publisher tells me that sales of Rise of the Arthropods have tripled since Dr. Eker was killed. Oh, that's wonderful. You directly benefited from his death, Mr. Winged Sheen. But it, it doesn't mean I killed him. You also had personal motive for wanting him dead, similarly with Don Plesminski. But I don't know either of those people. What motive could I possibly have? Miss Plesminski published a review of your book written by Dr. Eker in the most recent issue of her magazine. I'm sure it's not as bad as the headline makes it sound. There is not a hint of scientific fact in this ridiculous tale by an author whose work rivals the worst of this format. That stings, I'll admit it. Dr. Eker may have been right about the lack of facts, but you did use science to exact revenge on those who criticized your work. Mr. Winged Sheen? Oh, Anthony Winged Sheen is no more. I, I'm just prisoner number now. Sir, it's not as bad as all that. Is it not? There remains some hope. Well, I wouldn't go that far. Why? As a, as a buzzer girl, it's driving me mad. Get it out! <laughs> Mr. Wing Sheen is under attack, sir. What do you mean, under attack, Henry? The bees, sir. They breached the station house walls. Oh, uh, we need to get him out of the cells. Sounds like a job for Henry. Well, jump to it, Higgins. What? Why me? Why you? Is it bloody obvious? Yes. Sir. Well, go on. All right, sir. And you go with him. What? Go! Make way! Clear some space! Uh... Well, this means Murdoch. Mr. Wayne Sheen isn't a killer, but someone wanted us to believe that he was. 
Were there finger marks on the bottle that he found in his things? No, I assume he'd worn gloves when spraying his victims. What I hadn't considered was that the item was planted. Hindsight and all that. Hmm. Hmm. Things are getting worse, not better. And how are we going to get the bee out of the cells? Uh, I've been trying to figure that out myself, sir, and I think I'm having an idea. You? The world's got topsy bloody turvy. Well, go on, then, let's hear it. Well, sir, it says here that the queen bee emits a kind of uh, homing beacon to their colony. Another of the chemical factor bees use to communicate. I exactly. So, if we keep our hands on the queen of the colony, could we use her to lure the bees into captivity? I think that actually makes sense. It does, sir, but I don't think it's likely to work. One. Well, sir, we didn't find a large beehive outside the station house, nor did we find one at the marketplace where Miss Plesvinsky was attacked. So that tells me that the killer is the one releasing large numbers of bees. So they have the queen, then? Yes, but perhaps there is a way to rid the bees out of our cells and to discover who the true killer is. Oh. So we know of three people who have access to large beehives. Jabeesbrook, Sweet, and Miss Kent. And they all have connection to at least one of the victims. Kent's connected to all three. Yes, but I'm not sure Miss Kent could help us with our bee problem, given that she doesn't work directly with them. So that leaves Mr. Beesbrook and Miss Sweet. Have you been able to reach Mr. Beesbrook? I have not, sir. Then bring in Miss Sweet. I think that most of them, but I'll do one more pass. A professional would have exterminated these bees, and that would have been just devastating. Is that a bit of an overstatement, Miss Sweet? No, not all. Bees are crucial to our environment. Did you know they're responsible for pollinating many of our fruits and vegetables? I confess, I did not. Yes. Well, I've been reading up, and it's convinced me how important it is to protect bee life, which explains most of this. A smoker? How so? Well, apparently, smoking has been used to calm bees for centuries. Is that right? Yes, and calm bees are happy bees, which will make them easier to capture. Miss Sweet, where were you this morning at about 9 a.m.? Well, at home. Ending to my hives. So you had nothing to do with the attack on Mr. Wing and Jean? Oh, I wouldn't even know how to begin to make something like that happen. Well, that takes care of our bee problem. What about the other? Is Miss Sweet our killer? Sir, I don't know what to think. She claims to be an amateur, but her actions in the cells demonstrate some expertise. Chucker. See if you can find a connection between Miss Sweet and other victims. Oh, and while you're at it, please do the same for Mr. Beesbrook and Miss Kent. Me? What? No, I haven't had a spare moment all week. Sounds like you're not about to get one now, are you? Well, go on, answer it. Station House 4. Oh, sirs. Annie Wing and Sheen is awake. Oh, you'd fled by that point, Constable Higgins. But I imagine it was quite a sight. It's with those... Buzzing fiends assaulting me from every angle like a hurricane. It was horrifying. Truly life-changing. Yet it's given me an idea. For a new book? Indeed. Imagine a man. I knew it! Um, sir, could you know it in five minutes? His socks were sprayed with liquidized banana. He was targeted. That's strange. That sounds like the work of a rival author to me. I don't believe that to be the case. I need you to account for your movements yesterday. Well, I was in the market in the morning selling my books. Then I had a long lunch with my publisher, and I gave my second reading in the evening. Why? At some point, you crossed paths with our killer. Uh, Miss Sweet and Miss Kent were also at the reading, if I'm not mistaken. Sir, Beesbrook was at the market as well. Beesbrook! Ah! Ah! Yes. I recognize that name. Is he some sort of scientist? He's a graduate student. Yes. Well, the fellow assaulted me at my stall. Quite pompous, if you ask me. <laughs> what did he have to say? 
Oh, he had the audacity to call my book anti-insect propaganda. Told me I was soon to get my comeuppance and stormed off. Sir, that's a threat ever I've heard one. I agree. And, and what of Miss Kent and Miss Sweet? Anything of note there? Miss Sweet? Uh, I believe she gave me a jar of honey. Yes, she's quite keen for people to taste it. Hmm? Is that it? Yes. I, uh, she seemed, well, sweet. I, I doubt she had any cause to hurt me. Right. We'll start with Mr. B's book. I'm it, 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 it. But hang my things before you go. I, I hated my suits increased. So do I. Mm. And, uh, Henry, we'll need to be sure to hang on. Sir. Where did you get this? Oh. Yes, that, that, that was uh, the young lady at the reading gave it to me. What did she look like? Unremarkable. Glasses, I think. Miss Kent. Kent. Oh, Miss Kent? Stop right there. Detective, I didn't imagine I'd be seeing you so soon. I'd like you to explain this. I drew that from Mr. Wing and Sheen. It was intended as a threat against his life. I intended no such thing. No, that's an homage to his newest book. Then how is it you were expecting? Is it this? A constable took her telephone a short while ago asking about Dr. Eater's relationship with Mr. Eastbrook. And I wasn't aware of any issues, but I called him back as soon as I found this entry in his journal. The idea that Bees dares to communicate is absurd and childish. I cannot allow Beesbrook to mar this institution with this research. And Mr. Beesbrook decided to change the focus of his research last month. And Dr. Eaker didn't like the idea. If he knew about this, then he had motive. Thank you. Have a look at this, sir. It's from Ms. Plasbinski's magazine. That connects Mr. Beeswick to all of the victims. We regret Pierce be a letter of rejection. But that would give Mr. Beesbrook mode for all of the attacks. Mr. Beesbrook. Mr. Beesbrook. Uh, sir, that's a B. There's a B right there. No. Henry, take a closer look. Look the length of its torso. I think you'll find that this is a queen bee. We need to capture it. Give me a, a glass jar or something. Quickly. Yes, sir. No. Oh. Of course, that's why he didn't turn my calls. Oh, no. No. After that beat! Don't let him kill me! You see it? No, sir. Miss Sweet! Don't. Don't. Get on that. Stop! I said stop! Just a one more mission, my dear. Splash, sir. Well, I didn't catch her. <sighs> oh! What was that for? There was a bee, sir, being to your, uh... Oh. Well, in the case, thank you. I only wish we could have captured Miss Sweet, too, sir. She has an army at her disposal. 
We'll never capture her unless we defeat them. Well, how in the world are we going to do that, sir, when they think that she's our queen? By reminding them that she isn't. Is that the queen, sir? Yes. Alcohol should preserve the queen bee's chemical communication system. Why on earth would you preserve the bloody thing? So that we can use her to draw Miss Sweet's bees away from her. How can you be sure it'll work? Well, bees are intelligent creatures. They follow the queen. Exactly. And preserving queen bees was the subject of the article that was rejected by Miss Plepinski's magazine. Sir, I think I know why Miss Sweet targeted Beesburg. Why is that? Well, this file she had when she escapes her, it's from Beesbrook's office. It's a whole pile of research into dancing honeybees. And thanks, sir. Could the creatures get any more, Senator? What's your point, Heath? Uh, sir, the point is, the research wasn't Beesbrook's. It was hers. So you mean to say that Miss Sweet did all of the actual research herself? Yes, sir. Look. And Beesbrook took credit for it. That's why she went after him. That well, certainly wouldn't be the first time that's happened. So Miss Sweet wasn't the amateur she made herself out to be? So it would seem. So how do we get her without unleashing the little demons on us? I believe Henry can help. You shouldn't have come here. You, I would. You are very smart, Miss Sweet. In fact, brilliant. I read your research paper on bees using dancing to communicate. It's a shame that Mr. Beesbrook stole that from you. There's more where that came from. I know more about bees than any man alive. Indeed. I can see why you turned your back on Anthony Wynn Sheen, given he knows very little. What is it that they say? Don't reach your heroes. It tends to end badly. What I don't understand is what your other victims did deserve their fate. Oh, they refuse to take me seriously. Eager, he would even entertain my admission to stay. Said I didn't have constitution for the sciences. The only thing that I don't have that these forbid was a certain piece of anatomy. And Miss Plepinski? Well, without a piece of paper from the university deeming me an expert, she wouldn't publish me. But I hope that in their last miserable moments, they realized that this amateur was the architect of the deaths. Well, thank you for your confession, Miss Sweet. Now, will you come down to the station house and face your fate willingly? Surrender, you mean? Oh, <laughs> no, I think not. <laughs> Please, Miss Sweet, it would be much easier for all of us. Mm, another man trying to tell me what to do. It's funny. I'd wager that you haven't even realized. I had the upper hand all along. Good luck getting out of here alive, Detective Murdoch. <laughs> simply suing them with the sweet smell of lavender. A smoker? No, no, don't, don't! What have you done? Why aren't they listening to me? What have you done? They're simply responding to their true queen. And you, Miss Sweet, are under arrest. 
Excellent work, Henry. That was the most harrowing 15 minutes of my life, sir. But the bees were never even near you. Yes, but they could have been, sir. At any moment, they could have been. <sighs> what will become of them now? They'll be donated to the university. After the past few days, I suspect they'll be lining up to study bees now. Well done, gentlemen. Does that say what I think it does, sir? Mr. Winged Sheen is out of the hospital and is already working on his next novel. This one will be a sensational, fact-based account of a celebrated novelist targeted by a mad admirer. <laughs> Good. At least there'll be some veracity to the work this time. Well, how could there not be, sir? Oh, and sir, apparently there's a policeman feature in the new book as well. I bet you anything that he's based that character on me. I'm sorry, Higgins. But from what I've read, I don't think it's you that he based the character on. Me? Well, you must be joking. After all, I did for him. Uh, this won't stand. Where do you think you're going? To have a word with Winged Jean. If he's going to write about this, I expect to include it. Well, Henry has a point. Capturing Miss Sweet was a team effort, after all. Perhaps Mr. Winged Sheen could insert you into the story as a... as a sidekick of sorts, Higgins. Sidekick. Although... I do like the idea of a sidekick of my own. Murdoch is your assistant. <laughs> You're bloody kidding, Higgins. What's wrong with that? I think make a dynamic pair. Yes, we could be called the dynamic twosome. Ah, so it doesn't really roll off the tongue, but Winged Sheen can fix that. I've got to find him before he leaves town. The Higgins noosome twosome. Mm. Not so good. Call me Monty Luffy I've been making all this news so don't call me no pussy I had to switch it up again, I'm creating, I'm goofy And if you try to fuck it up, I won't end up so spooky Faves Faves Gungo fruit, call me Monkey Luffy. I've been making all this moose and don't call me no pussy. I had to switch it up again, I'm creating, I'm goofy. And if you try to fuck it up, I won't end up so smoothly. Stretch it out, Gungo fruit, call me Monkey Luffy. I've been making all these moose and don't call me no pussy. I had to switch it up again, I'm creating, I'm goofy. And if you try to fuck it up, I won't end up so smoothly. Don't make me go gear four. Because I'ma start a riot, maybe even start a war. I'ma use my bare fist, I don't even need a sword. I already got a source, man, you know, so I finna roar. If you fuck with my crew, my Angus finna sore. I'm I'm called a fifth ever for a reason, I'm as crazy as a boar I'ma hit you with this one piece as I goof off and explore I might get myself in trouble, but I always get the score, yeah Stretch it out, gunga fruit, call me Monkey Luffy I've been making all these moves, so don't call me no pussy I had to switch it up again, I'm creating, I'm goofy And if you try to fuck it up, it won't end up so smoothly Stretch it out, gunga fruit, call me Monkey Luffy I've been making all these moves, so don't call me no pussy I had to switch it up again, I'm creating, I'm goofy And if you try to fuck it up, it won't end up so smoothly I'm kidding, call me bro, cause I'm back to the bone And when my crew is on trouble, I get in the zone You made me mad, boy, and I cut you near the stone So if you meet me in person, you better watch your tone We gonna be on call one day, we did it all Alone. There is no issues or bugs, it's like you saw the dawn And at the end of the day, bitch, I will not die alone Because I am a father, I will sing for my own Pussy boy, get out of my way You don't wanna waste me, I got these sticks in my veins Pull up in an ass fool, I will send you ass of space For your 30 horsepower, do you wanna fucking taste? And I'm not a shit talker, but I'll put you in your place If you want the one too, I will send you off the way And I'm not in the joke, shit, these kids will not be played that's what I'm gonna say Stretch it out, gunga fruit, call me Monkey Luffy I've been making all these moves, so don't call me no pussy I had to switch it up again, I'm creating, I'm goofy And if you try to fuck it up, I won't end up so smoothly Stretch it out, gunga fruit, call me Monkey Luffy I've been making all these moves, so don't call me no pussy